you can make out the giant charcuterie chart behind me. I'm standing on the set for Civilization All You Can Eat by Dixon Grove, which is our current production. We hope that you all will come back and join us for the 8 p.m. show tonight and a post-show discussion with our artistic director and the director of the show, Howard Chalwitz. Um, if you haven't already gotten your tickets, there should be a ticket discount in your packet. Um, before we get started, I'd like just to say a couple things. Uh, first of all, we are all so happy that you all can be here in person. We're also um, going to thank our friends at the American Voices New Play Institute for live streaming this event as well. So please be aware that it is being live streamed, so be on your best behavior. <laughs> um, we want to encourage you to follow along the conversation on Twitter. It's hashtag CyberNair with two R's. Um, we've had a slight change to the schedule. Unfortunately, Don Marinelli was not able to be here. But the good news is we have a third cyber narrative uh, to share with you today in development. In addition to the plays by Lynn Nottage and Christopher Diaz, we're also going to be able to show you a little bit of the development for uh, Harrison Rivers' play, Look Upon Our Loneliness. So that's a great, that's a great third edition. Um, lastly, I just want to say that uh, the folks that you're going to be hearing from today began to shed some new light on digital media for us here at Woolly Mammoth at a pretty critical time. When we and some of our colleagues were invited to participate in this project, um, we felt like we were, we were sort of beginning to ascend a pretty steep learning curve about digital media. We knew that it was going to be essential for us to respond that digital media was transforming the landscape. Um, but at the same time, we sort of felt like we were going in without a map. We couldn't always predict the expectations that artists would bring to projects that involve technology. We couldn't always predict the expectations that patrons would bring in. And in some ways, we felt like we were sort of doing all of this learning on our feet in a very public and exposed way. Because, of course, digital media very often affords a degree of transparency that we don't usually experience in our work here at the theater. So one of the things that I really admire about this project is that the Black Women Playwrights Group always conceived it as a public learning opportunity for the field. And that's why we've invited you all to come and start to learn a little bit about the projects that these extraordinary playwrights and students have been beginning. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the questions and the challenges um, that we've started to encounter as we start this very new work. And we're also very, very eager to hear questions and reflections from you all about the implications of this work for the field and for possible collaborations between artists and technologists moving forward. So thank you all so much. You're a really important part of this process. Uh, now I'd like to uh, introduce the founder and president of the Black Women Playwrights Group, Karen Evans. <laughs> Thank you, Mary, so much. Uh, and I'm pleased uh, to welcome all of you today uh, to the launch of the Cyber Narrative Project. BWPG is a service and advocacy group, and we've been a service and advocacy group for women writers of color uh, for 22 years. We actually, ironically, got our start at Arena Stage in 1989 at a symposium for African American women playwrights. We've been serving the Washington, D.C. community for most of those 22 years. But as you know, somewhere along there in those 22 years, the internet was born. <laughs> and we realized we could actually be a national group and a local group because the internet was this marvelous thing that linked playwrights and dramaturgs and theaters and everybody else together without the usual boundaries of, is it a local phone call or is it a long distance phone call? So we began to think about how do we become a national organization? Our first national project was in 2008. And in Chicago, we gathered 100 women writers of color from across the country. We asked them, what do you need to have a better career and to make your professional career as a playwright work 
more, for you to work more, for your plays to be more produced, to reach more audiences. And they listed three things. They needed more access to university productions and residencies. Because every playwright is looking for a home, somewhere to rest for a minute, to get that first draft of that next play. And that's often what a university residency can do for you. The second thing that they needed was more information about the world of presenters. The world of presenters is very, very complicated. And the world of presenters for women writers of color is particularly important because women writers of color tend to write one woman shows and they often will perform them themselves. So having a way to take that one woman show and launch it out into the world was very important and that's why the world of presenters is ultimately very important to my membership. The third thing that they were sort of vaguely like a twinkle in their eye talking about was digital media. What's going on online? <coughs> Can this help us reach more people? And the answer absolutely wasn't there, but we decided we're going to ask the question. We're going to forge ahead and begin to ask, how can digital media help us widen the audience for theater and, of course, still let theater be theater? So in April 2010, we held the second smaller conference in Chicago, linking platforms, theater, and digital media. And at that conference, we brought together playwrights. We brought together theaters. And lucky for us, we also brought together, brought in Don Marinelli of ETC. And we spent two exciting days talking about the possibilities. And BWPG put those possibilities into a basket and came up with a design for this project. The first part of the project involved the central idea of starting with the art. Since we are playwrights, we thought, how can we create a project that's artist-centered? What was the most exciting thing to us was the idea of playwrights returning to the center of their plays, that impulse, that pulse that made their hearts beat fast and made them sit down and write that play. And next, we thought about theaters. And the theaters we went to first were the theaters who had an amazing reputation of being at the vanguard of supporting new playwrights and supporting new plays. So we reached out and we were welcomed by about Face Theater, Intersection for the Arts, Penumbra Theater, the Movement Theater, Dallas Theater Center, Victory Gardens, Geffen Playhouse, the Goodman Theater, and Woolly Mammoth Theater. We asked the theaters to do two things. First, find a partner within that group who doesn't live near you <laughs> so we could produce the same play twice and therefore gather information about how audiences in different parts of the country would react to online content written by playwrights who had a play being produced in their season. Second, after they found a partner, they had to choose a play that they both wanted to produce by a playwright they had, that they felt had the creativity and the skill to write the additional online content. And as those of us who have dated know, finding the right partner <laughs> and making it work can be really daunting. And after many discussions among the theaters about what comes first, it's not the chicken or the egg, but in our case it was the partner or the play, after lots of talking over summer of last year, they came up with these four or five playwrights. And it was, it was really an amazing learning process, which is the most exciting thing, as Miriam said, at every step we have learned. We have learned, they have learned, well, I've learned too, who we are artistically, what matters to us, and who's my kindred spirit. And I'd like to take a moment uh, to especially thank Howard Charlotte and Miriam Weisfeld for providing fearless leadership.
during that process and again welcoming, welcoming us here to Woolley. So here we are today and these are the playwrights that we are going to welcome today. We are going to welcome Christopher Diaz, Lynn Nottage, and Harrison Rivers today to talk about their projects in process. And we are also delighted that playwrights Ch Christina Anderson and Chinaka Hodge will have projects in the 13-14 season. The second part of our cyber narrative project is 12 tweets at 12 noon. And that is a Twitter series that you can receive on your phones or your desktops, which at noon, three days a week, you will receive a complete scene in 12 lines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's really challenging and very intense to really get to the matter within 12 lines. So we'll be launching that series in April, and uh, you'll see in your program our Twitter name, and please follow us, and then you and too will receive 12 tweets at 12 noon. This is a research and development project, and we're focused on building models. This model came together. We think that there are other models. We think that what this particular model that came together, which was theaters who loved playwrights and an educational institution that loved drama and computer science, uh, we think that this may be one model. But because this is a research and development project, we think there are lots of models out there. And what we want to do, as Miriam said, is ask questions. Because we're all trying to take the magic that happens in a darkened room that we call theater and figure out how to share it. So we're here today to ask questions. So thank you for coming and helping us ask these questions and frame the discussion of what theater can look like in the 21st century. Thank you. now introduce Chris Wu from Carnegie Mellon ETC Global. Chris has an extraordinary career in theater as a designer and as a writer as well and also many many years in writing game designs and many many honors uh, for his game design and his writing uh, and he has been, uh, ETC really has sort of been a great organization and a great educational institution to find because they my favorite thing I've learned recently is the Venn diagram and the two circles and that space in between. Well, ETC lives in that space in between where the world of theater and the world of technology blend. So, Chris. Okay. Probably been 30 years since I stood down state center, so <laughs> this is kind of an interesting experience for me. Um, the history of the ETC is really in, uh, a working example of the way we uh, educate our students every day. The, the idea for the center came out of the mid-90s when uh, the Carnegie Mellon Drama Department alums were encouraging the Drama Department to broaden their educational vision. Uh, work was being done in the digital domains, in film, especially at that time, and the, nowhere at Carnegie Mellon were the, were the art departments yet ready to embrace this idea that storytelling was going to be revolutionized over the next 10, 15 years to bring us to where we are today. Um, Don Marinelli was associate head, uh, dean of the drama department at the time, he had known a colleague in the computer science department, the late Randy Pausch, and they conceived of this idea to try to, as the tagline goes for the program, bring the left brain and the right brain together in a single program. Um, part of the uh, inciting incident for that was the computer science department actually had reached out to drama to help them with a uh, interactive question and answer virtual interview with, I think it was Albert Einstein at the time, they had written artificial intelligence to choose uh, Albert Einstein's answers to the questions and they were allowing guests to come up and type text into the computer and ask him essentially anything and the AI would 
match the question to the library of potential answers. And they realized that the way they had put the project together, Einstein was sort of wooden. Uh, and they knew they needed a little juice from the drama department to bring the character alive. So they called over, Don walked across campus, and that really began the collaboration. As, as Don began to work with the computer science department, he realized that they had more in common than they really had differences. And especially with this edict coming from Los Angeles that we, the drama department needed to figure out a way to get its students into the mainstream of the technology world, Don and Randy conceived this plan to create a graduate program in which they would intentionally mix artists and technologists on sort of a 50-50 um, ratio to begin to open up the possibilities for when the two sides communicate. Uh, Don and Randy toured uh, Walt Disney, they toured Pixar, and they asked companies that were embracing the technological revolution in an artistic way what they most wanted graduates from this program to be able to do upon graduation. And the answer came back, collaborate and communicate. That if you could get the technologists and the artists to work together and understand each other's vocabulary, you had chances for great things to happen. Um, and so we created, well, Randy and Don created a program that's still, even to this day, sort of unique. And that's partly facilitated by the deal with the devil that Don made with the university, which was to leave the ETC alone. Um, anyone who's ever worked in academia knows that there's this labyrinth of deans and reporting structures and, and agendas that sometimes even in the best universities, can be monolithic in their um, inertia, right? And, and so Don made this deal where he said, we'll, we'll make it on our own, we'll sink or swim on our own, as long as we don't have to answer to either the drama department or the computer science department, but we forge and create our own new center. And the, de the, the, the provost was like, sure, if it doesn't cost me any money, what the heck? Uh, and so that's, that was, it turned out to be that, that decision made possibly, I wasn't around at the time, out of necessity is really what facilitates our process because we could invent ourselves whole cloth. And I was still working in the video game industry at the time, but once I got into academia and I talked to colleagues struggling with the same issues that the EQC struggled with, I began to understand the wisdom of that. Because if the, if, if the college has a computer science department, and the computer science department wants to start an interactive media division, well, they're going to look at the problem like a computer scientist would look at it, and their entire curriculum is going to be driven by the needs of the computer science department. Even though they might invite, invite artists to join them, it's going to be a computer science tinged idea. Same thing with the fine art department, right? Um, the, the, the same thing will happen on the other side of the fence, but because Randy and Don could make decisions out of the good of the program itself, not worrying about anybody else's vested interest, we have a curriculum that seems very odd when you look at it. Um, the first year students mix together uh, Randy's uh, famous class, Building Virtual Worlds, with improvisational acting, with uh, an introduction to film and storytelling, along with like a fundamentals of ETC course where they're taught how to do things like give presentations in public. And you know, looking at it from the outside in, when you sort of look at those courses, some people have remarked, where's the meat in that process, right? Well, all of the courses are really kind of um, head fakes to teach the students to collaborate, iterate quickly, and communicate with each other. And that's what the students learn over their two years. Um, because of Don's love and passion for theater, he had been in the drama department at CMU for, uh, Lord, 20 plus years. Um, the, the department has a hip, heavy tinge of drama in it. Uh, there's Don, Brenda Harbour, who teaches improvisational acting, 
and me, interestingly enough. Uh, when Don met me, he sort of exclaimed that I was in some ways the poster child for the ETC, because even before Don got to CMU, I had gone through the drama department. I was a working set lighting and costume designer in New York for a number of years, <coughs> and uh, I had resisted the, the pull of going to Los Angeles like many of my classmates, John Wells and Holly Hunter among them, and I stayed in New York and did theater because I love theater, I still love theater to this day, and when I made the transition, which is a longer story than you have time for, into the game industry, I realized that the theater aesthetic informed every decision I made on a daily basis when I designed games. It seems sort of odd if you look at it again from the outside, but those inside the industry understand exactly what I mean. And so a career in video games developed out of that career change. Don met me, and I was standing in front of him when he visited my game studio saying, you're a drama guy who works in video games. That's exactly what we're about. The students at the ETC end up in three main areas. They end up in the gaming industry. They end up in feature films driven by animation, computer animation. And they end up in places like Disney where theme parks today are so technologically driven that you, know, you can't really build a new ride without computers sitting behind the scene sort of making all the decisions and driving all the technology. And so what you, what you end up with is this interesting fascinating hybrid of the arts and the sciences sort of in one place, worked on collaboratively by the students every day of the year. It's an exhilarating place to work, uh, made more so by the amazingly wonderful students that come our way. And, you know, as the, the video game industry and the animation industry has grown, uh, we have an alumni base working in the industry that's pretty astounding. Um, there's rarely a major film release in the animated space or a video game that's a hit that doesn't have one of our alums working on it in some capacity. So we feel, I think, justifiably proud of the fact that the students come out of our program having learned this art of collaboration. So when Karen and Don met at that conference, uh, this is kind of like a softball up Don's uh, alley because to be able to bring a little of what he's learned about the way interactive narrative and the internet works and hopefully get the um, drama and theater world to embrace this new environment rather than being sort of a little skeptical and maybe a little afraid of it. It really answers that call that he was given in the mid-90s by the CMU Alumni Network in LA to get the drama people more involved in this space because it really is the future. So the project for us was a, a welcome opportunity to really bring to bear everything we stand for. And it's been, for me personally, uh, a great experience to work with the playwrights and, and to be involved from the ground up, which Karen was so generous inviting me over the summer. She talked about where we sort of worked through a lot of these ideas. I did some workshops and we've had a really great time doing it. So. That's sort of the summary of how the ETC got involved. Um, next up here is one of the playwrights. And let me just mention before we move on that one of the real joys of this experience for myself, and there's a dramaturg student from the drama department who you'll, you'll meet later who's here with us, was this collaboration with the playwrights and how giving and generous they were uh, with their precious babies and allowed us to sort of play in their backyard with them with these works. So I really wanted to just give a shout out to the playwrights as being really a wonderful part of this process for us. Um, the first playwright we're going to talk to is Christopher Diaz. Uh, Chris, come on up. Uh, the problem with following a teacher is that you always feel unprepared for class. <laughs> These are my notes. Um, but uh, 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 so I, the reason why I'm sort of uh, stammering a little bit is that I was going to say something and then I saw this and I'm sort of struck by it because um, 
role-playing epic stories, uh, vivid characters, this leads directly into the play that I wrote, uh, which is about professional wrestling. And um, this, is what I, this is how I spent probably the first 16 to 17 years of my life before um, girls entered the picture, was watching <laughs> professional wrestling um, and thinking about uh, you know, following the vivid characters and epic story, uh, stories, and then role-playing and playing wrestling. What I used to do um, all the time with my best friend, Evan Weissman, who lived in the building, uh, in my apartment building, is we had wrestling action figures and we just sort of played with them constantly. We created stories and we wrote down in our notebook who was fighting who and all that kind of stuff. And um, I had been watching wrestling um, at that point for, I don't know, since just before the first WrestleMania. I, was, I would ask how many of you are wrestling fans, but almost nobody admits to it. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, and I, you play TV folks, I know there's wrestling fans watching on new TV. You play TV. Um, uh, so I've been watching since the first WrestleMania, since a little bit before the first WrestleMania. And um, at the same, which is 1985, 80, oh, Ali's here, hi, Ali. Uh, 1985, 1986. Um, and uh, in, while I had also been a big wrestling fan, my, my dad would take me to Madison Square Garden or the Westchester County Center to go see wrestling. And on other weekends, my mom would bring me into Manhattan and we'd go to see theater. We'd go uh, to see all kinds of different stuff. As I got older, I started to see more theater, a little bit less wrestling uh, live. But I, I watched the two of them together. Um, and the reason that I mentioned them both is that growing up that way, growing up a sports fan and a wrestling fan and a theater fan, uh, high and low culture distinctions did not mean a whole lot to me at the, from a very early age. They felt all sort of like the same thing. Um, Storytelling. And again, ideally, da, 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 right? So um, for me, it was already, it was already a, a pretty blurry line. Uh, the other thing that factored into it, which I didn't realize until I was just sitting here and sort of obvious, is that I played hours and hours of uh, Mario Brothers. Uh, my mom um, bought me Legend of Zelda, and then I almost never got to play it because she's always in my room playing it. Um, <laughs> it's true. Uh, uh, and then I played a bunch of video games. And well, some of those video games that I played were wrestling games, including pro wrestling for the NES system, which we've talked about a little bit. I'll tell you more about that later on. So anyway, so uh, I did all this stuff that was always about brightness and loudness and colorfulness, but at its heart, you were always looking for a story that was being told. In, in wrestling, um, just like in, in all professional sports, in any sport, there's a person, usually two people, but you're usually following one person who wants something very badly and goes through a process of going ahead and trying to get it. And then I would go see a play, and it was the exact same thing, and it sort of didn't really separate in my mind the way that I would understand that it separated in other people's minds later on. Um, I went through the whole process of becoming a graduate student and learning how to write plays and pretending that I liked Shakespeare and, um, and, I don't, but, um, and, and all that kind of stuff that you're supposed to do when you're, you know, you're learning about high culture. And, um, <laughs> uh, and it's not good having the students up on the front of that. Oh, good. <laughs> Um, but uh, uh, you go through all that and you start to think, I'm going to write these great plays about big ideal, big topics and things that you know and, and large topics like that. Over time, I realized that the thing that I knew better than anything else in my life and probably better than most people in the world was professional wrestling. And I realized uh, while I was doing, while I was starting to think about maybe writing about that, was that there were a lot of similarities between my understanding of the world of professional wrestling and my understanding of the world of professional theater, my understanding of the world of the politics, uh, political situation, particularly in the United States. They seem disparate, but to me, again, these boundaries and distinctions were not very drawn very clearly. So I decided to uh, start writing a play about you know big, dumb, um, silly entertainment that is professional wrestling, but finding the sort of deeper ideas that would satisfy the high culture, quote unquote, high culture part of my brain. So I wrote this play called The Elaborate Entrance of Chad Deity. Uh, we, uh, it was produced in Chicago and it's been produced a couple times. Uh, from then on, I'm, that's not the point of the story. And the point of the story is that uh, about a year ago, um, I got the, had the great opportunity um, to talk to Miriam and Howard and everybody here at Woolley about the possibility of doing the show here. And I'm not supposed to say that we're too... We're, <laughs> we're thinking about doing it. It's under consideration. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, it also uh, under consideration at uh, the Dallas Theater Center right here. So um, at, at this point, um, a couple of theaters were thinking about potentially doing the show. Miriam 
contacted me about this, this incredible project that was going on and um, thought that the play might be a good fit for it, that, that me as somebody who's always uh, on Twitter or playing video games, whatever, might be a fit for this kind of cyber narrative project. I was like, totally, I'm in. Um, Dallas seemed like a natural partner at that point. It's a, a theater that is more technologically advanced, theater space that is more technologically advanced um, than just about anybody. And uh, the possibilities of bringing things together were sort of amazing and sort of remarkable. So uh, fast forward, we're trying to figure out what the heck we're going to do um, for a cyber narrative uh, or a cyber component, an online component that would work with the play. <coughs> and my mind first goes to the play itself. And if, if uh, folks know the play, or I'll tell you about the play, um, there's a huge video component. And again, it goes to professional wrestling. There's always these big video screens, and there's always a lot of stuff and flash that goes into uh, production of this play. And so we tried to figure out ways that that could be integrated into this process. And we realized pretty quickly that there are too many variables in that equation to, to create something that could move pr from production to production. You can't create a Chad Deity video entrance package that can move from production to production because it's always going to be played by a different actor, it's always going to be different designers, a different directorial take. So we had to sort of scrap the idea. We, we, we had thought about putting together sort of a virtual toolkit that any uh, theater who was going to produce the play could have access to to create sort of a unified sound and style and feel to their production. Um, so that felt, you know, we, we decided against that for a bunch of different reasons. And then we came to the idea of the problem that always seems to exist is that you're going into a theater, a high, you know, a highbrow kind of uh, location, and you're trying to get people to understand, yes, the topic is professional wrestling, yes, that's kind of silly, but it's not necessarily just a silly play. There are themes, there are ideas, there's all that kind of good stuff going on. So um, in talking to Miriam, talking to Lee, we talked a lot about how do you prepare an audience to come see the show, particularly an audience that isn't professional wrestling fans or professional wrestling sound. So we decided to come up with a, a game of some sort. And at first, again, the idea, the, the first idea that pops into your mind is create a wrestling game. Um, wrestling games uh, tend to all look the same. Um, and you tend to run into the same problem with a wrestling game. How do you represent the main characters of your play when they're always going to change and be different? Also, how do you get across the sort of themes that are going in the play? How do you prepare an audience for what they're going to come see um, through playing a game where they play a character and wrestle and throw somebody else around, particularly when you're dealing with audiences that may not be interested in playing a game at all to begin with. Um, my, mind, like, <laughs> uh, my mind, of course, went to you know, WWE, SmackDown versus Raw, and how do you create a, the same kind of experience so that people who like video games will then want to play theater. The A, constraints of time, that seemed like a little bit of a crazy idea, and B, it didn't seem to speak to real, the real issue here. Um, and so what we decided to come up with was a way to prepare uh, an audience, especially non-gamers and non-wrestling fans, to come in and, and understand the play that they were going to see. Um, so we wanted to talk about the themes in the play, and there's a bunch of different themes in this play. It's about uh, race and ethnicity and capitalism and consumerism. Um, but in talking, particularly talking to Miriam, we realized that what we wanted to, uh, an audience to know before they came in was that there was this fundamental idea behind if there's a winner, um, particularly in the United States, but if there's a winner uh, anywhere, there's a loser involved. And oftentimes for there to be a really great narrative and you have a really strong winner, you need to have an equally strong, if not more compelling, loser involved. And that's really sort of at the core of this play. Um, to backtrack track a bit, just talk about what the play is about. It's played, uh, you're going to hear a monologue later on um, from a character called Mace, who's what's known as a jobber, uh, who's a guy who loses to the big stars. Uh, everybody thinks that he's the worst at everything, but he's actually the most talented guy in the ring um, because his job is to make the other guys look good. So we wanted to really focus on telling that story and, and getting that theme across. So we decided to come up with sort of a puzzle platformy kind of game. Um, I'm going to throw a lot of terms, I, I would throw a lot of terms out there that these guys know way better than I do, but uh, instead of a wrestling game where you're fighting, more of a game where you're trying to solve some sort of problem and you're doing it by by utilizing this idea of a loser putting himself into position to make it look as if the winner is doing all of the work. Um, so I think these guys will talk about that a little bit more, but basically the idea, again, going back to this Super Mario sort of video game, what would it be if, if folks have played Super Mario, you basically you start a Super Mario on the side of the screen and you had to get across to this side of the screen. What if you think that you're playing a Super Mario, 
but in fact you're actually playing as Bowser and you have to move this way instead. And it's a oh, super oversimplification. Um, but the idea of either the bad guy or the prize that's happening at one end moving towards the hero instead of vice versa. Um, and so um, in talks, uh, Chris mentioned the dramaturg dramaturgy student before, but I want to shout her out specifically. Uh, Dana Shaw, who's sitting up here in the front, we talked a lot about how do you get to this conclusion, how do you get these ideas across, um, what kind of look and format and feel do you want to come across with. At the end of that process, uh, Chris and Dana and I uh, were able to sort of create, uh, or I, 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 with feedback from Chris and Dana, was able to sort of create this large, overly large, uh, 20 level video game experience <laughs> where the game mechanics changed between the third level and the fourth level and the, if there's 18 different kinds of game mechanics happening in the final level until Brad told me that I couldn't do that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then we started, and then we, we started shaking, out, shaking it out together. Now in the last couple of weeks, um, we've been able to get online in a, in a Google Plus Hangout session um, where I already feel, I, I'm used to feeling like the youngest person in the room in the theater. Uh, conversation. I feel 20 years older than the students, um, and significantly, significantly less knowledgeable about what we're doing. But we're starting to narrow it down. Um, I think these guys will be showing this later. But the animations have been created. There's a little Chad Didi character and a little Mace character, and, and El Toro is a whole other character uh, who's sort of involved in the mix. And the game's sort of starting to take hold in a much more manageable form. And I think what we're going to do with that, again, I don't know how much these guys are going to say about this, but I think what we're going to do about that is take it to both. Um, of the theaters who are considering doing this play, uh, take it out to their, particularly to their uh, student groups that they work with, younger folks that they work with, but also finding ways to make it available just to pay general patrons, subscribers, folks who are otherwise uh, connected to the theater, let them start to mess around with what has turned into a pretty simple to follow um, game and start to get a little bit of a hang of, uh, of what, we're doing, what, what they're going to see when they come in and see it on stage. Um, so I think that that's a little bit of what we're talking about here. Um, I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to let somebody else come up and talk. Um, uh, JJ Perez is uh, coming to the stage. He's going to read a clipping uh, series of monologues from the beginning of the play, uh, the elaborate entrance of Chad Deaton. Thanks. So every time I'm about to get in the ring, I think back to 1986. I'm six years old, my younger brother's five, my older brother's eight. We're sitting on cold hardwood floors on Kruger Avenue in the Bronx on Saturday mornings eating frosted flakes that are really just generic flakes of corn with generic spoons of sugar sprinkled on top with a little drop of milk to give the impression that shit is gonna get soggy. When even then we all know that there ain't no Tony the fucking tiger growling at our poor Puerto Rican asses from the front of that box. But still, we ate it, and we drank a quarter of water right along with it. No soda in our house. Unhealthy. So it's 11 a.m., Saturday morning, on the roofs, fake flakes, my brother clotheslining my brother, and my brother setting up my brother to try to body slam him. And that's when my grandpa would walk in. Already dressed, always dressed. The head flick up so he's looking down his nose at my brother and my brother and they stop in a second and he doesn't have to say nothing because the body slamming ain't going to happen when he's in the room. <laughs> and a cup of coffee. And he looks at the TV. And he looks at me. And he laughs and he says, It takes most people a long time to know what they love in life, grandson. But I think you already know. So I got a job doing exactly what I love. I am one of the wrestlers. I'm one of the really fucking good the wrestlers. <laughs> and that means, unlike other jobs, where when you get really good, you become a boss or a star or you get paid more. In wrestling, being really fucking good, like 
really fucking better than like how good you think I'm gonna be for me telling you that I'm really fucking good. <laughs> <laughs> when you get really good at the wrestling part of the wrestling business, you're not rewarded. You're unrewarded. De rewarded. Dewarded? <laughs> Sorry. Being really good at the wrestling part of the wrestling business means you make the other guy in the ring with you look better than he is. So you get in the ring with some guy who sucks and he looks like he's kicking your ass. And the audience wants to see guys who can kick guys' asses. So then that guy gets the applause, then that guy gets the credit. Then the boss loves the job he did making that guy look like he didn't suck. So then you get to make the next guy who sucks look like he doesn't suck. Because the more guys who don't suck, the better for the wrestling. Because guys who don't suck sell t-shirts. <laughs> but the problem with that is, is that while you're getting your ass kicked by guys who only look like they don't suck, because you're the one making them look like they don't suck, the audience starts to think, Guess what? <laughs> you're the one who sucks. <laughs> so then, and uh, let's drop the metaphor here because I'm not really talking about you, but thank you for playing along. So then I go to the bottom of the minds of the boss because I'm losing so much. And as bad as I want to walk into his corporate bank in your office and remind him that wrestling is not a legitimate sporting event and that I'm losing because he's writing the scripts that tell me to lose. And as bad as I want to tell my boss that, I don't tell him nothing. Because it's actually a good job, a dream job, an underoos and bootleg frosted flakes on the floor daydream job. And I'm happy to lose. And I'm happy for the audience to tell me that I suck because when I wake up in the mornings, I don't even need an alarm clock. And I don't mind that my knees hurt and my hands hurt and my everything's hurt. I don't mind. Because I'm one of the wrestlers. And I'm in love with who I am. Give them a taste if they've never had it 
about what building a software project is like in the real world. 14 weeks in the software world is an instant. Most software projects take much, much longer than that. But the idea is that in those 14 weeks, they'll go through a typical software development process where they will come up with an idea, they'll early prototype the idea, they'll hone the prototype, they'll test it with users, and they'll deliver the artifact at the end of the semester. And through that process, they learn how to make it happen, how to schedule themselves, how to not leave everything for the end of the semester and crunch to get it done, and all those things that they really need to know before they get out in the real world. Another important thing is that they learn how to interact with clients. Um, typically, the advisors in most projects stay out of the picture. We only interject ourselves if, for some reason, the client's having a hard time articulating maybe what they want. Um, typically, that often happens with big corporations because you know, behind the couple of representatives that the students are interacting with is many people that those two or three representatives report to and, you know, it's often hard to navigate that political space and so the message gets watered down by the time the students get to it. But uh, typically only if uh, communication is an issue or the students or the client is frustrated do we sort of step in and act in more or less a parent role. We try to avoid that totally um, because really it's important for the students to do things to learn by them. Um, it, this partly comes out of both the software engineering school at CMU as well as the drama department. Drama department's pretty typical, right? People build sets, they, they act in plays because unless you do that you don't really learn anything. Well, it's the same sort of uh, paradigm here at the ETC. Um, the, this student team has two of what we call producers. Uh, in the software engineering world, a uh, producer is more or less a project manager. And what I'd like to do is hand it over to the two producers on the team who will introduce the students. Uh, Brad Buchanan and Josephine, stand up. Um, introduce yourself, well, Brad and Josephine, or <laughs> but if you could talk a little bit about what a producer does, and if you could just give us a snippet of what your background was before you came to the ETC, and that sort of goes for everybody, so that, that everyone can understand the broad base of people that we bring to the ETC, and then you can introduce your team. I'm Brad Buchanan. I'm the lead producer on the project this semester. My background is computer science, uh, but I'm coming in with an opportunity to try and learn how to use my communication skills and to guide a team to produce this on time and high quality. So I'm Josephine. Um, so I'm the creative producer. So what that means is I work mostly with the creative team that we have here, which I'll introduce um, in just a minute. Um, so my background before coming to the Entertainment Technology Center I was in online advertising, um, yeah, specific, so a lot of web experience. Um, if you guys want to check after. <laughs> and so I guess if you want to, right here is Evan. Uh, he's one of our artists. Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Evan Brown. Uh, before coming to the ETC, I was actually a mechanical engineer. Uh, I changed careers very quickly into computer graphics. Got a degree in Pittsburgh, and then ended up uh, joining the ETC to help out with making projects. Um, I specialize in illustrations, but also for 3D art as well. And uh, love it every minute of it. I'm Dana Shaw. I am actually not a part of the ETC, but I've been working closely with them. Uh, I am a dramaturg from the School of Drama. And so I have been doing that for the past four years now. And that I, yeah, you all know what a drama trick does. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it my turn? Yeah. So, so as you'll see, we have three artists. And as a typical artist, I'm very bad at math. But there's six of us on the team, and half of us are artists. Yeah. Hi, my name is Raya Brownwright. Uh, no relation to Evan. Um, 
My background is in traditional animation, and you could say I was a professional comic book seller for a very long time <laughs> before I came to the ECC. And learning to work with very left brain people has opened up so much in my right brain <laughs> that I am uh, just very proud and happy to be a part of this pursuit. Next to Raya, we have Lee, who's one of our technologists. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Lee, and my background is software engineer before I came to ETC. And I'm very interested in computer graphics part, and ETC was focusing on making video games, so. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Last but not least, we have Emmanuel, who is also a technologist and a writer. Yes, um, I, my undergrad is in English and drama, and um, I was hoping to, well, write. Uh, but I always worked as a programmer, and uh, here I get to do, hopefully, both. Uh, actually, I'd like to say the first day we get to DTC, something Don Marinelli tells us is look around you at each other. Everything, everyone here always does something and something else. And I think that's true, <laughs> definitely, of most of us. All of us. So the first project we're going to talk about is uh, Chris's project on the elaborate entrance of Chad Beatty. We're really thrilled about this project. And as Chris said, it's an online action puzzle game that is supposed to introduce the online audience to the world of Chad Beatty. And while it's introducing them to the world of Chad Beatty, it's managing to convey some of the same themes that the play is. Uh, we've called our project Beyond the Stage because our goal is to take live theater experiences find the heart of those experiences and convey them online outside of the theater, with the, hopefully with the goal that we will eventually bring it full circle and build an appreciation for live theater and audiences that haven't been reached yet. In the case of Chris's play in particular, uh, we are absolutely thrilled to be working with Chris. I, I, in particular, have really enjoyed this so far because as somebody at the ETC, as somebody with a computer science background, I've come in and been studying game design and trying to learn about how meaning shows up in games, how you express things through interactive media. And to me, it feels like a really hard problem. And it's something that it felt risky to say, you know, let's bring in the playwrights and have them design our game. Because I thought, this is what we've been training for. <laughs> But Chris came to us and he had this document of a design for an online game that would be this Chad Beatty experience. And on the first read through, I was just astounded. It did everything I had been studying. It explains the meaning behind Chad Beatty through the actions of the player and the actions of the audience. And I thought, that's so hard. How does this work? But then after a little reflection, I thought, that makes perfect sense. In the future, you understand how actions create meaning. That's something that's been hard for me in the past. But here, it's natural. It's what you do. And so the opportunity for me to learn that directly from people who work and live in the theater has been so valuable. Um, there are several gameplay influences for the game that we're creating. Uh, Chris brought some of these to us, and some of them we brought to the table as well after we heard what his vision was. A lot of these are online flash games that exist already. Uh, they're small, compact experiences that create just a bite of meaning that they hand over to the audience. Some of these we can talk about are, there's the one-in-one -one story, uh, which is a short experience in which you control two characters at the same time, and it, the story is all about reuniting those characters, but the way in which you do it creates the story of their romance and their relationship. Uh, Another is this Kuroshi Suicide Salaryman game, which sounds a little bit crazy, and it is a little bit crazy. Uh, but one of the things that the game does really well is it produces a set of rules that the audience is supposed to understand, and then it repeatedly breaks those rules, level after level, to try and keep the audience on their toes. That does two things. The first thing that it does is it causes the audience to stop and think. And if you're going to convey meaning to an audience in a game, it's important to make them stop and think. Because if they're just going nonstop, there's no opportunity for them to process the meaning that you're trying to create. The other thing that it does is that it causes them to think laterally and realize that maybe the rules aren't really what they thought they are. And one of the themes that we found in the elaborate entrance of Chad Deity was this message about the world of pro wrestling that sometimes can be applied to the real world as well. Where in pro wrestling, there are these rules that are understood, like you don't climb out of the ring. 
but they break them over and over because it's what puts on a good show. And, and if we can do the same thing in gameplay, that seems important. Next, Evan Brown is going to tell us about the aesthetic we've chosen. So, um, you guys got to hear from uh, Chris Diaz. And uh, if you didn't notice, he kind of geeked out about old school games. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, you know, Zelda, that kind of thing. So, I latched on to that. And luckily, you know, he chose this kind of thing to use as an example because, you know, just like in all artistic communities, there are movements. And right now in gaming, there is the indie movement towards 8-bit, 16-bit, also known as retro gaming. So what, what's happened is a lot of us as gamers ha are getting older and we're starting to, to get nostalgic about them. We want to see what, we want to play the games that we used to play at home. So when I got to talk with Chris, uh, we started to look at old games and how can we make this idea of this, you know, Chad Deity character and his companion Mace, and how can we make these two live in a world that kind of feels like the old school <coughs> And so here is a concept artboard. These are things that we have to prepare for our clients so that they can get an idea of what we're thinking, because the hardest part as an artist is matching the client's vision with our own and making sure that what we're making is what they want, right? So this is a sample concept art board of just all different things. Um, sprite demonstrations. What would these characters look like today, high-res vectors? Or what would they look like, say, in the NES version, when they have limited color palettes, limited uh, pixel sizes, that kind of thing. Um, and I know this is all very technical, but it, it does come down to the visual quality of the game. What, what does it feel like when you're playing? And if we really want these old WWE games from the NES era to come through, then we have to try to stay true to the faux hardware limitations behind it. It also helped us save a lot of, or solve a lot of problems that Chris mentioned earlier. So, Chat Deity is a production that's going to be represented by different actors, right? Well, I don't know. I don't, can you guys identify these sprites? <laughs> can you see the faces? No, not really. So it helps us keep the characters, though they're identifiable, they're also a little, um, how would you say, non-identifiable, impersonal. You can, you can project a face onto these little sprites and make it your own. So when you do go see the production, which we hope you do, uh, you'll be able to recognize them immediately, not by the features, but by the personality behind them. Um, also here, just little animation sprites, that kind of thing. What is our plan? And, uh, and to talk more about the technology behind getting all this art into the hands of users, Emmanuel. Um, <clears throat> hello. Um, yeah, so one of the first things we thought of was um, Flash. Uh, Chris suggested Flash. Um, but Flash has its downsides. I'm an I love open source, and Flash is not open. And also, Flash doesn't work on some mobile devices. So um, we looked at what was available, and we decided on the Impact Engine, which is, I may be getting a little technical here, uh, HTML5 and JavaScript. It means it works on pretty much every modern browser without anything else. You just open the web page, and you can play the game. Uh, that includes, well, yeah, Windows, Mac, Linux, Android, iOS, um, and Impact also comes with a level editor. That means that maybe in some distant future, if all this gets very popular and we need more levels, it'll be relatively easy to add them. And um, so, so far we've had a lot of success with the Impact engine. And, um, oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, what Chris was talking to us about with these different levels was a way to establish the arc of Chad Deity in terms of figuring out a way to convey the theme. So we are looking at starting with a level that basically shows Chad Deity doing what he does best, power bombing. So he pretty much, you know, will be able to go up to Mace and powerbomb him. Easy. 
simple. <laughs> you can understand what the basic tenet of the game is through that. Level two is the jobber, which is where you realize that Chad Deity can't do much else. <laughs> Chad Deity can only pretty much power bomb. So we need to actually move Mace. We need to move Mace to Chad Deity so that Chad Deity can power bomb him. <laughs> so now it's a new understanding of what the game is. Level three introduces, you know, objects so that we can figure out how Mace can move objects so that Chad Deity can powerbomb him. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you seeing a little bit of <laughs> So now that we've established the rules of the game, we go to level four and level five, which are cheating, essentially. We are breaking the rules of the game. So in level four, Mace will move outside of the game. Mace will move outside of the screen that we have developed and <coughs> do something else that he has to do in order to get to Chad Deity to be power bombed. <laughs> so it's setting up, so basically it's setting up a premise and then breaking it, which, you know, is a big part of what the actual play is about. It's setting up the premise of this is what wrestling is. So after that, we have the handicap match and fighting through the fans. And these are basically just going through the same idea of, now the players kind of don't trust us. They don't trust the rules that we have set down, so they are looking for ways to break out through that. They are looking for ways to explore the space that we've given them in ways that we haven't told them about. So, obviously, the end result is going to be the same if you play it right. Chase gets power bombed. But how you get there changes. And how you get there depends entirely on the jobber. It depends on the moves that Mace does to make Chad Deity be able to power bomb him. So we've also talked about the possibility of unlocking features after seeing the live show, whether that means that we give people a code after the, after the performance so that they can unlock something that allows them to see a little bit more into what Mace does, whether that means it goes to a blog, or whether that means that now the focus of the game is not on Chad Deity powerbombing Mace, whether it's about Mace doing something and Mace acting. So we are still trying to figure out exactly what that would be, but it would be something for after you've seen the production, after you understand the flow of the story and how the game completely connects to the performance. So it's a way of saying, here is a little something extra for you to understand the character and the theme. So now, this theme. So I'm gonna go into a little bit about our behind the scenes, our process of how we come up with these concepts, you know, how we work with them. So one of the guiding principles that we always follow is to launch and iterate. Because, you know, we can research all day long. Um, that process can take very, very long. It can take us the entire semester just to research. But what we really want to do is rapidly prototype and get, um, get, get, our, get the product out there and get as much feedback as we can um, before we sort of you know, launch it completely. So the way I like to think about it is sort of you know, creating a treatment or an outline first and then getting as many people to read it, um, especially the people that you're trying to reach. So even before we uh, talked to Chris, um, we you know, took all the research that we had and uh, we came up with, you know, first we talked internally, you know, is this fun? You know, are these characters in line with what we think this is going to be? Um, and then in that process, um, we come up with sort of the second iteration and a third iteration. Um, and even more formally, we will have testing groups. So our first alpha testing internally is slated for the end of this month. Then we will have one again in March and then again in April. Um, and then at that point, you know, we sort of get all the final feedback and then pass it along. Um, so I think next slide. Um, so the, in terms of deployment strategy, I know you, we talked a little bit about the technical, technological decisions that we made. And the main reason is that the reason we, you know, Emmanuel talked about HTML5, why, it's, why we chose something that was accessible is that hopefully, you know, we can package this and then hand it off to the theaters. Um, you know, or release it potentially on something like the App Store or <coughs> release it onto the internet so that people can actually find this on their own. Um, and I think that's a really important thing because the discovery for this game, uh, you know, what 
while we want to package it for the people who are actually coming to see the play, we also want people to be able to discover it on their own to some extent. And I think that's all I have for this portion. Um, I believe we have a copy. Yeah. Um, if we've got any questions uh, um, that these folks just described, um, please. Yeah, Bill. Um, this is a question for Dan. Um, just curious, I know they're dropping very good, um, but uh, uh, my son is seven years old and he's a serious gamer, so it's been interesting watching him and seeing that there is kind of story, especially like he loves the Mario stuff and it's basically a girl gets kidnapped and you jump over barrels and do stuff and you get her back. Um, do you, did you do um, any sort of survey of video games that gave you a sense of, of what the customary storytelling techniques or storytelling style that, that might exist in some of these retro games that, um, that you were able to incorporate in, in this sort of hybrid of, a, of an actual playwright <laughs> writing a play and but writing a play that sort of sits in this environment? Right. Well, I played them. <laughs> um, when I was younger, you know, I had a big great like, Game Boy that I played the same Mario games on. I don't really think the Mario games have, have changed that much. They're, they're pretty much the same basic, like, get from here to here, try to rescue princess, fail. Uh, princess is another castle. <laughs> so then you keep going. But um, we were not, we, we were looking at, at what those games would do like at the basic principles for those games and how there is a, a basic idea that all of those games follow. Where, you know, they're generally pretty simple objectives and the objectives that we've, we've put out as well are pretty simple. Like, Maze gets power bombed. How, but the difference is how you get there. Like in some of the Mario games, you might have to go down one of the tunnels and, you know, go into an underwater world and you're like, Mario can swim? When did that happen? Um, and you wind up having to face all of these different challenges that makes each level different. And we were trying to figure out a way to do that while conveying theme. And so I think that that was, that was a challenge that, that Chris and I talked about a lot. Um, because we, you know, we, we wanted to be able to say, this is what Chai Deity is about, while also giving a really fun game. So the fact that we looked at these different levels and said, how can we, how can we convey theme through this? Um, and I mean, the theme that we decided to work with was, what is a hero? What is a villain? How can you deconstruct those roles and make it something so that you wind up playing the villain? That's something that not a lot of a lot of the old school games really did. So, uh, like Chris said, if you if you all of a sudden in one of the, the games had to play Bowser, like if Mario for some reason was trapped and you have to get Bowser to him so that Mario can defeat Bowser, like that's that's what we were going for. So we're kind of turning some of those those uh, things on the, on their head. Another question. How many minutes will the game be? And <laughs> Is 14 weeks long enough to design such a thing? <laughs> <laughs> so the exact length of the game varies a little bit depending on how the player goes through it, but I would say it's approximately 10 minutes. Okay. That's my guess right now. Uh, 14 weeks is a tight schedule for that kind of development process. Uh, but we've designed in such a way to keep it within parameters so that we can finish that within 14 weeks. We're very confident that it'll get done. I, I have no question it will get done. I just didn't know <laughs> how many days you were working 24 hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> they are graduate students. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, does the game uh, point people back to either the history of the production of the play or the upcoming productions? I mean, how do those, how do those link together? Um, we will have some links to the history of the production of the play. I think that the play probably will have another home somewhere on the web that we can point to information about it. 
Uh, chances are that information will be available both on the first screen people see when they load up the game, or when they finish it, they'll get reminded, by the way, this is about a live theater production that you should really go see. Um, we've talked a little bit about ways that we could have it point them to upcoming productions of the play, but that's a technical challenge that might be outside of our scope this semester. Uh, we're going to talk down the road about that. Um, I actually, this is a question for you guys, maybe for Chris too. Um, I am, I'm actually really curious about that. Um, if, I don't know if you have any stories or anecdotes you can share about the decision to make the game for the people who have seen the show or already have their tickets, as opposed to a whole different audience group, which are the people that you want to get to see the show, and sort of um, how you came to that decision and what challenges you're finding in the development process to make sure you're sticking to the story of the user being the person that's attending the production, as opposed to considering attending the production. Well, a part of that comes from uh, there would only be one level or one one thing that would be available to the people who are who have already attended, just kind of as a yay, you attended. Here's something extra um, because you know we want to further the understanding of the play after they've seen it. Um, Beforehand, I mean, it's going to be open to anyone with an internet connection. You know, it's going to be, hopefully, we're going to put it on as many uh, sites as we can. Probably like Congregate, which is a lot, it, it just has a lot of these games. And the game, like, we don't, we have no way of knowing if it's going to go viral, which means that, you know, millions of people could see this game and play it, and then be pointed back to Chad Deity you know, the, like, the productions, or at least, at the very least, you know, Chris's website, which can say the productions. Do you want to talk a little more about that? Or yeah, I mean, I think, I think, um, I think the hope would be that it gets as open, you know, it, it gets, it's, it's open to as many, I mean, it's, it's open to everybody, no matter what. The idea would be that it would get in front of as many people who are just into games as much as possible. I think the parameters are so, are really specific and really small. We have this short window of time. We can create six levels, and so we're sort of creating a, a, a smaller game that maybe it's which is a full and complete experience, but maybe it's not like the hardcore fans who play games for who are looking for 20 hours of gameplay or whatever, or 10 hours of gameplay, whatever it is online, um, are not necessarily going to uh, dive into that the same. I've been playing the same game on Congregate for like. A month. Uh, my wife is mad at me about it, but like, I don't think we have that. I don't think we're able to create that same sort of length. And I know that talking to the two theaters that we're specifically working with, um, my question to them immediately was, what are the things that we can do to help the audiences that we know are already coming in? So I think it's mostly about a scope question. Um, for me, like the idea becomes like, <laughs> because my idea, my mind sort of goes everywhere. My idea when we start thinking about this is, well, we can make it huge, and we have the level editor, we can make it gigantic, and we can make an app, and we can sell that, and you don't even need to know. And ideally, it would be like, like uh, Brad and everybody was saying, you can pick it up in the app store, um, play it for 10 hours, get to the end, and then say, oh, this is a marketing thing, or you know, this is connected to something else. But I think in terms of the scope of the project, it made more sense to be sort of, um, in terms of immediate distribution, be distributing it to the two audiences that we know are uh, involved, and then hope, hoping that it goes beyond that. Um, I just wanted to add that I think that you approach the problem differently if the play was a brand new work mm -hmm. and you were looking to add an online component that would kind of, let's just say, be a cliffhanger for the play because you could sort of tell story in both spaces that way. I know Karen and I had discussions about this early on that maybe in some future iteration of this, you know, if the idea sort of catches hold a little bit, that people might think of the online presence being a, not simply a reflection or a, um, you know, in, in, in the mirror darkly version of the play, but really being an enticement. You know, have this experience online and then lead you into the play to see simplistically what happened, right? I mean, the, we, we debated those issues a lot at the beginning about how to use the online presence. There is also the fact that um, the play requires a, a pretty specific or unusual state of mind in which we only in the play mostly hear bad things about Chad Deity, but we know that for most people outside, he is the hero, but from our point of view, he is an 
So the idea, I think, is if you play the game, you can get into that mindset also outside of the theatre, so you can get probably a fuller understanding if you see the play or if you've seen the play first. You can regain that state of mind outside. Um, it's, well, the, the same state of mind outside or beyond the stage, which is one of the... Yeah. All right. That is, Ali, that is actually an excellent question, and it's one of the questions that um, we're hoping to tackle in the panel discussion at the end of the afternoon session, is uh, the potential of tools like this to actually be social media marketing tools and incentivize attendance as opposed to just be for an audience of people who already have their tickets to the show, for sure. Yeah. And then just, I know we're, but then just to piggyback on that, from the artist's perspective, the exciting thing is then to understand marketing and incentivizing and ticket sales and all of that in a way that's actually still art is actually still narrative. So figure out another piece of, of your story that's being told um, before the audience even gets into the house. Other questions? Yeah. So let's, let's just assume this is mad successful and you know, satisfying artistic experience, satisfying audience experience, and now we want a video game with every new play that anyone's producing anywhere. Or, you know, uh, the importance of being earnest, you can find the handbag. Um, uh, what I'm having trouble envisioning is where's the practical model that ever lets us do this again when we don't happen to have a room full of captive graduate students and, uh, you know, uh, uh, is there a way that this could become a routine part of artistic creation, and, you know, like go, go well beyond theater, uh, you know, art gallery openings, things like that. Like, does anybody have a vision for how this could become routine? I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, One of the things that I'm involved in when I'm not advising this project is trying to use the new kinds of social gaming incentivization to introduce ideas to audiences in sort of a backdoor, head fake kind of way. Um, and, and there are monetization schemes I think you could look at. I'd be happy to talk to you about that, and obviously other people are thinking about the same thing, right? Um, one of the biggest changes in gaming over the last five years is this idea that you don't have to put a game in a box and charge $50 for it. That you can give it away for free if you monetize a small portion of that. And those games also, thankfully, are relatively inexpensive to build. So. I, I, can I just say something to that real quick? I think what, one of the most exciting things to me, but I'm a theater practitioner and a tech junkie, so that's my background, um, is, is the, the wealth of creativity and possibility that happens when the technical mind speaks to the artistic mind. And just to sort of put it out there to the audience to sort of marinate on, is DC is sort of the second largest theater city in the country, and the DC tech industry is the fourth largest, or DC is the fourth largest city for up and coming tech companies, startups, et cetera, in the country as well. So if this is, if we look towards the future, this is a really great geographic location for work like this to exist. That's all. Is there a dollar budget for the project? And if so, where did it come from and who's responsible? Um, no, is the answer. Um, the, it's an educational project, so in some ways it's being funded by the individuals in front of us because they're paying <laughs> um, But um, because I spent so many years in the industry, I know how much it would cost to build out there, but we don't keep internally, you know, budget numbers or cost things. Uh, I'm sorry, I meant for the, this project, the Chad Deity game, to build the Chad Deity game, is there a budget? I assume it costs money to use, do whatever it is you do with HTML and Flash. Um, it's all free. The, the ETC, uh, is, is doing this work pro bono for the Black Women's Organization playwrights. So Karen, you've done some fundraising. Yes, yeah, yeah. so and we have been really lucky to have on the exterior part because the interior part is ETC and their wonderful graduate students. But for the external part, uh, we have had the Joyce Foundation step up and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation step up uh, to 
fund the playwrights and also to fund this little narrow window that they're talking about. How do you get people to understand that this is happening in conjunction with this play? How do you introduce audiences and potential audiences to this play? And so we do have some funders from foundation uh, and our participation in the project goes in sort of to holding all of it and to making sure after ETC does their magic that there is outreach to teach people that this is going on with this particular play. Let me turn the question around if I can. Who will own this thing at the end of the process? Tom, I'm sorry to interrupt, but this is actually uh, the reason that Tony Lupo is coming in um, in the next session to talk about intellectual property. It's another huge question that's come up as we've begun the work here. And I love that everybody's mind is kind of rocketing forward to those big questions. And those are the ones that we're going to tackle after the break. This is a good segue. Um, we're going to take a 15 minute break. Uh, please help yourself to coffee and snacks in the lobby. When we come back, we'll hear from Lynn Nottage.
I am pleased to introduce Lynn Nottage and try to, well, find words to introduce Lynn Nottage. <laughs> but I'll, she is one of the most produced playwrights in America. And I'll throw out the words Pulitzer and MacArthur. <coughs> and the list of theaters is way, way too long. But I would also like to say the most heartwarming thing about Lynn Wattage for me is that she has supported the Black Women Playwrights Group forever. Yes. And it makes my heart stir when we come up with these slivers of ideas. And she'll say, OK, I'll come. <laughs> <laughs> slivers of ideas. Uh, and then again, we have come up with an idea that has grown from a sliver and because of her participation and her support as well. So I introduce to you Lynn Nottage to talk about, by the way, Meet Vera Stark. Hey everyone. I have to say I'm really, really happy to be part of this conversation. So thank you, Karen. And thank you, Carnegie Mellon, because Vera Stark, by the way, Meet Vera Stark, was originally conceived as a transmedia play. And when I went to Second Stage and said, this is the play that I want to um, I, 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 I produce. It's a play in three acts, the first act being a screwball comedy. The second act begins with a traditional film. And the third act is um, digital media. They said to me, OK, we'll do the first two acts, but you're on your own for the third. <laughs> and so I, I ended up building a very primitive website, um, which got surprising, a surprising number of, of hits given what it was. But let me just sort of back up and explain what the play is. By the way, meet Vera Stark by way of sort of introducing um, how I'm involved in this project. Um, the play examines the legacy of racial stereotypes in films of early 30s. It's a multi-platform play, genre-bending play, that uses film and digital media to piece together the life of Vera Stark, who's an African-American actress who's crippled by ambition and racism and a culture that really doesn't know quite how to how to um, fit her in. Um, the first act of the play, as I mentioned, is this fast and furious screwball comedy in which Vera Stark, who's this young, headstrong actress and maid, is trying to get into a film like Gone with the Wind. But in the case, um, this film is called The Bell of New Orleans. It's a southern epic, a very traditional film that you might find from the 1930s. And she's willing to do absolutely anything to get in to this film. The second act of the, the play begins with an excerpt from the film The Bell of New Orleans, and it's told very much in the style of the period. It's a classic melodrama that feeds all of the worst stereotypes that you can imagine from that period. And the, the second act begins with the last scene in that film. And then immediately we jump 70 years later and we're in a panel with a group of African-American academics who were sort of arguing over the legacy of this particular play, uh, this particular film called The Bell of New Orleans. And the academics are all battling for ownership of Vera Stark. And um, they, this is sort of discussed while they're also looking at a clip from a film. Um, I'm sorry, they're looking at a clip from a television show that's a Dick Cavett-like television show where Vera Stark appears for the last time. I know it sounds very, very confusing. I promise you it isn't. But it's sort of by means of explaining this project that it is multimedia, and it's trying to mix lots of many different ideas and sort of play, play with perspective. But the third act, and the third act is what's really important to the conversation here, is the third act was always um, conceived to exist on the web. It's a site that was created by one of the academic characters named Herb Forrester. And the site examines the legacy of Vera Stark. It's a classic website um, that um, is, is designed to keep her alive. It introduces a documentary, which you will see um, here later, that's made by Herb Forrester, not Lynn Nottage, not the Carnegie Mellon folks, but it's made by the character Herb Forrester, very much in his aesthetic, which means that it has a kind of gritty homemade um, feeling. The website also has selections from her autobiography. It has fan memorabilia. It, it's also going to have a conversation um, between um, 
those people who are sort of interested in invested in Vera's character in the period. And hopefully the, the website will be evergreen, which means that once the play is long gone, that this website will continue to generate interest and will ultimately no longer be curated by me, but curated by the people who, who are interested in Vera Stark, or interested in old cinema, or are interested just in this game that we've created, which is the Herb Forster website. Um, I, I, um, I always envisioned this play, as I said, in three acts. It was a play that crosses time periods, and thus I want to incorporate the vocabulary of each er era in um, each era of Vera Stark. So the first era is the vocabulary of um, screwball comedy. The second era is the era, um, it takes place in two, the year 2000, so it's very much sort of an academic vocabulary. And then the third era that I want to examine is the way in which digital media has um, shaped the way in which we view the past. And that's what we're trying to explore here right now. How do we create this new vocabulary? Because I do see it as a new vocabulary. And how do we take these characters that I've created um, two, three years ago and have them leap out of the proscenium, past the fourth wall, and have this evergreen life um, where they get to interact in the with the audience in a very different way. Uh, the play, however, and I want to make this clear, remains the anchor because I'm a playwright, I'm a storyteller, I'm always going to be sort of rooted here to the stage. But I want the play to be a leaping off point, to be a departure point for a story that's more expansive and dynamic and that invites the audience to be a storyteller as well. I'm really interested in seeing how our stories can be reshaped once we invite an audience to be part of making that story. I don't know what that means, but I'm interested in finding out what that means. And um, this piece, uh, as I mentioned, was always conceived as a transmedia piece, which means that the website is not an addendum. It's not something that's sort of tacked on at the end. The, the website is the third act. It's part of the narrative. And that the play is not complete without all of these three elements, the first act, the second act, and the third act um, inter interacting. And I also want to make cl clear, because I know that a lot of times transmedia is used as a marketing tool. I don't see this third act as being a, a marketing tool, an advertising tool. I'm really interested in how it can be a storytelling tool, a creative, artistic tool in understanding the characters that I've fashioned. So um, what I'm going to do is show you a clip from the, the play, which was created by um, myself, um, my husband Tony Gerber, who's a director, we managed to get an incredible cinematographer named Stuart Dreiber who shot the piano to shoot it. Um, this clip that you'll see has um, Sna Latham, um, Stephanie Block, um, Karen Olivo, and Kimberly Irbera. And what it is, is the last scene in the movie, The Bell of New Orleans. It was created as closely as possible to the way in which a film from the 1930s would have been created. So it was shot um, on Panavision, and we had a little stocking over the lens to give it a diffused um, um, feeling. Um, the lighting was, was kept sort of low and moody. And um, without further ado, I present The Bell of New Orleans. And then afterwards, I'm going to show the documentary. So I'm going to just sort of slip to the side. Shame and misery. I'm an octopus. 
Typhoon, Cecile. And eventually he will discover the truth. I have the blood of a noble French family. And look how much good it has done me here in New Orleans. He loves you. What does it matter? Now, but what happens when he finds out that I am the daughter of a slave woman? Will he still want me to be the mistress of the Grand Line of Oh, don't cry, Marie. What is it? It's the fever. <laughs> no, Cecile, it won't. Um, I'm dying. My poor sweet Marie. Oh, there you is, Miss Cecile. Madame Pierre be warned you yesterday. She fit to be tied. Now you best be getting down there before she came your head. Rest, I'll be back shortly. Don't leave me. Rest. Sorry, miss. Tilly gonna take good care of you. Show sure enough is. You gonna get through this, and soon you'll be back out there. Madam Grace nearly finished with your gown, and come Friday, you gonna put it on and be the prettiest thing that ever done dance the quadrille at the Magnolia Ball. Wouldn't that be lovely? What is it, Tilly? Tell me. Miss, Mr. Lafayette is here to see you. Tell him I'm not here. I can't bear to face him, not like this. Not now, not after all that has happened. But he already knows he's here. That rascal Cash has done told him. Tell him to go. Tell him I'm sleeping. Tell him anything. No, I can't. No, no, I don't want to see him. He ain't want me to say, but he missing you something off. Oh, won't you tell him to go already? Good miss. And did it bring us alias? You know he always do. And does he know? Did you tell him that I'm dying? I don't know what he know. But I do know that he here. You know, it's that man out there loves you. And if you send him away now, it's gonna be a real shame. You can't keep hiding from the world. Talk to him. Tell him how you feel. Tell him you love him. Because you and I know there ain't no other man in your heart but him. How do you put up with me? Miss, what you want me to tell him? <laughs> tell him to remember me on that warm spring day we went boating on the bottom. I was wearing that violet cardigan that Mammy made. It was a perfect afternoon as perfect as it could be. And if he remembers as I do, we didn't ever want it to end. I'd like to think of us that way. <laughs> Miss Marie? Miss Marie? Come to me, Miss Marie. Oh, Lord. You remember when we was youngest, running barefoot in the backyard and you done found that wounded bird? You know what you said, let it die. You taught that all them to fly again. And you that bird. And I ain't gonna let you go without a fight.
the beginning of the second act of the play, which was sort of an unconventional way to begin a drama, which is um, with a film. And so the next thing, if, if you'll bear with me, that I want to show is um, some of the content from the website. And this is a documentary that Herb Forster, who's one of the academics in the film, makes about Vera Stark. The Bell of New Orleans, a film which in its inception nearly bankrupted Celestial Pictures, overcame its rocky beginnings to catapult the studio and its starlets to immortal fame. It's essentially a picture about outsiders. But was the film an artful masterpiece or a lucky confluence of lesser talents? Three artists are widely credited with its success. Director Maximilian von Oster, who's sort of almost by, by desire, not quite in the mainstream. Cinematographer Mo Taubenschlag. Taubenschlag started out as a, what we would call a second year director of photography. And actress Vera Stark, a leading lady in a maid's uniform. Stay awake, and together we'll face a new day. In the early days of American cinema, black actors weren't even cast in films. You'd often have white actors in blackface, and so a film like Birth of a Nation comes to mind, or even some of the early versions of Uncle Tom's Cabin. It was no accident that The Bell of New Orleans was produced on the cusp of the implementation of the Hayes Production Code, which enforced certain traditional moral standards on the movies, such as banning extramarital sex and miscegenation, the mixing of the races on screen. My blood is pure, but it carries a drop of shame and misery. I'm an octoroon, Cecile. The whole idea of miscegenation and uh, the fact that uh, the leading character had black blood, uh, that, that was not something that the code dealt with afterward. The fact that the black and white characters mingle with a quite modern Many scholars point to this film as the straw that broke the camel's back and got the code put into place. Tell him you love him. Because you and I know there ain't no other man in your heart but him. How do you put up with me? A lot of cinematographers, some up to the present day, feel there are a lot of issues involved in writing black and white characters in the same scene. That was like, maybe because he was Brazilian by birth, in fact he came from a little background. Yet it never seemed to him a conflict. The Bell of New Orleans burned many bridges, but out of the Pyrrhic fire emerged Vera Stark, one of the brightest African-American stars of the 20th century. She really led the way along with actresses like Ethel Waters or Patty McDaniel, Nina Mae McKinney, Louise Beavers. So being that, that kind of trailblazer, it opened the doors for those actresses who came after her. Through the 1950s and 60s, she was an ardent civil rights activist, frequently participating in marches and using her startup zeitgeist towards integration. At one point, she's staying at one of the very fancy hotels in California and tries to use the swimming pool. And unfortunately, it created such a stir among the other white patrons staying at the hotel that the workers had to clean the pool and refill it. As a victim himself of discrimination in pre-war Europe, director Von Oster claimed to understand the plight of African Americans in Jim Crow America. He was oppressed in Russia, of course, and being Jewish, he felt the oppression from birth, so to speak. So I think he had a sort of sense of humor about a dark sense of humor. But his sense of humor was not nearly as legendary as his dictatorial style. Max was very sort of didactic. Go over there and send. Stand there. But Von Oster was different with Vera. With Vera, he would go over and whisper in her ear. You wouldn't hear what he said. There were rumors of an affair which at the time were scandalous. Von Oster never denied it. He was a ladies man. He once said that uh, having affairs with actresses was an occupational hazard of directing films. It's like direction or erection, he said. The success of The Bell of New Orleans is due, at least in part, to Von Oster's unwillingness to compromise with Celestial Pictures' conservative morality. When the studio found out that he planned to set this film in Bordello, they were very upset about it. 
you know, you can't put this in a goddamn whorehouse. He convinced them it was more like a club. And uh, it wasn't really a bordello, and it wouldn't be come across quite that way. Of course, it does come across exactly that way. Marie, what are you still doing in bed? Von Oster's vision of an antebellum bordello and its virginal prostitute with a heart of gold, as played by Gloria Mitchell, has achieved an unexpected immortality, even if he rankled some producers along the way. His obsessiveness with details that really didn't photograph was uh, drove the studio crazy. I mean, I remember they had a scene in some picture where they had a, a lot of army personnel, uh, the Russian army or something, and he insisted that the underwear be the same as the Russian army. And Sue said, the nobody's going to see them in their underwear. What do you care about that, Max? He said, but the actors will know. After the Bell of New Orleans, with the implementation of the Hayes Production Code, Von Oster had a tough time in Hollywood staying employed. He was blacklisted for his affiliation with the Communist Party. Over the next several decades, he faded into obscurity, barely scraping by as a commercial jingle writer. I think he was a little bitter. He was living in a very small house in the valley that I thought was his, but it actually was his housekeeper's, because he was broke. If Von Oster has any legacy, it is the career of Vera Stark, who got her start with the role of Tilly, the maid. Vera was able to get away with more in The Bell of New Orleans as a pre-code film because she was able to speak truth to power. Vera's later career was plagued by alcoholism, the abuse of prescription meds, and a spiral of disengagement from everyone close to her. But through sheer force of will, she continued to work. Vera Stark did two weeks at the Folie Bergere in Vegas, and I caught one of the shows. She was quite extraordinary. She had the audience in the palm of her hand. I saw her briefly backstage, and then she showed me a little bunch of heather that she had in a little plastic bag that she carried with her. It was good luck. And she said, Max gave that to me. I found out later, years later, when I was studying mythology, that heather was the tree of the love goddess. So maybe she knew that. In 1973, after her short-lived run in Vegas, Vera Stark disappeared. There have been many, many rumors as to what happened to Vera Stark in her later life. I don't know if I can speculate. I can only hope that she found peace and happiness. I think what's more interesting than the truth is that the question exists in the first place, right? That we don't know what happened to Vera. Although the circumstances surrounding her disappearance are shrouded in mystery, what we do know is that her legacy endured. My favorite line is, is the one everybody seems to like from the Bell of New Orleans. Stay awake, and together we'll face the new day. Stay awake, and together we'll face a new day. Stay awake, and together we'll face a new day. It's a great line. With a message that is paradoxically antiquated, yet decades ahead of its time, Vera, Tilly the Maid, and the Belle of New Orleans exhort us to stay awake, to resist the forces of censorship and cultural recidivism, and then together, only together, may we face a new, better enlightened day. For MeetVeraStock.com, this has been Herb Forrester. Remember to stop by the site for new revelations and upcoming events in a city near you. So I'd like to invite the team up. And as you come here, I just want to um, say a little something about the, the video. I think that the video is is representative of what we want to do with the website is blur fact with fiction and so that when people are visiting that they're engaged with the website regardless of whether they've seen Vera Stark or not. You know, um, anecdotally, there are people who went to the Meet Vera, Do uh, Meet, um, Vera Stark a website who didn't know that it was made believe and Herb Forster was actually invited to lecture at the New York <laughs> Film Academy. <which> <laughs> And he, Herb has a website, and there are people who actually engage Herb as if he's a real character. And I think that we, as a team, want to play with those lines and see how we can keep this conversation open. So, as Lynn introduced, the goal of the Meet Vera Stark online project is to be in Act 3 to her play, and to create a space where a community can form 
that collaboratively explores and invents Beer's career from her appearance on the screen in the 1930s to when she vanishes from the public eye in the 1970s and maybe beyond. Uh, there's a lot of ways that that's going to happen, but to begin, I'm going to have Dana talk to you about some similar past projects that we've seen that have influenced some of our brainstorming on this project. So, Lynn has told us that this is a transmedia project. Uh, other transmedia projects that similarly blur the line between uh, fiction and reality are alternate reality games, which <coughs> use multiple media platforms in order to tell a story that people can become involved in as themselves, rather than as a character. So they become part of the story, they're able to change the course of it sometimes, and they're able, their actions mean something in the world of the story. Uh, oh, we don't have our... We'll move back to the <coughs> Yes. Okay. Um, could we, I think it's the next slide. Yes. <coughs> Wonderful. Um, so, a lot of alternate reality games will blur that line between fiction and reality and present itself as a tenant of reality while also addressing the fact that it is, in fact, fiction. They're not like, they, they aren't trying to trick you uh, into believing that, I don't know, aliens are descending to Earth and you have to help fight them, for example. Um, so it's acknowledging the fact that it is not real, but it is encouraging you to suspend disbelief and take part. So that is one thing that we are really going for with Insight is to uh, express, you know, this this is fiction. Here are the people who are involved in creating this fiction, uh, but please play along with us. And let's see, we are looking at, uh, we're also looking at things like puzzle hunts, which are, are similar to alternate reality games in that they have, um, they have a thing that all that a lot of people must work toward in order to get a certain like a, a group result. And let's see. So we have been working with the existing meetyourstark.com, uh, which, as we've mentioned, you know, it presents it as reality. It presents it presents the reality of Vera Stark through Herb Forrester. We are also looking at other other sites that are doing similar things, uh, two of them being Out My Window and Duality uh, with Mark Bradford. Uh, as far as the system goes, uh, Lynn wants it to be something that she is not entirely responsible for in terms of upkeep. So what that means is we have to look at how people can enter this community and influence the creation of content and you know we have we will be working to layer contribution so that there are people who are at the top who've been with the site for a while and they are able to look at new content and say oh okay this sounds like it should be a part of the Vera Star canon so we're looking at you know sites like Wikipedia sites like Reddit uh, things that are community driven and Next, uh, are you going to talk about just system stuff? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then. Oh, for one of the challenges that we've had with the, the design of the Meteor Stark project is that the way that it's like an alternate reality game is that you have people interacting as themselves with this site that was created by Herb Forrester, who is a created character. And and talking about the character of Vera Stark, who is a created character, but through that they're bringing up real issues. And when you're trying to come up with an aesthetic for a website created by a fictional character, getting in the mindset of what kind of a website would this character create is a really interesting challenge. Uh, and that's part of the reason that we've turned um, to the existing content, the existing website for our, our primary influence in design. And because we have to build a community, we're turning to community websites online for the same thing. Uh, in terms of technology, uh, again, this is a website. So it's going to be something that's going to be accessible from any kind of a computer with a browser that you have, from the majority of your mobile devices. For purposes of development, we're using a web framework. Um, 
we, we've picked one that we think will work really well, and the reason we're doing that is it's going to allow us to do really rapid development and to expand the project down the road if necessary without having to start from, from zero, essentially. So the launch and iterate process that I alluded to for Chris's project, you know, here it was especially important because, as Veronica mentioned, we're trying to create a website as if Herb Forrester would create it. So, you know, is Herb Forrester someone who's not uh, familiar with websites? Would he use sort of a prepackaged solution? Or would he get one of his students to help out? And I think that was really important because, you know, when we sort of brought the, the framework and got it in front of them as soon as possible, you know, we were able to sort of get more of an understanding of you know, who exactly Herb Forrester is and how he would create this website. And I think um, also particularly, I guess, challenging for us or something that we're um, working towards is making sure that we are, because we have a limited scope, you know, we want to make sure that we're providing a framework where, you know, as Linda mentioned, it is evergreen. So what that means is, you know, after we hand it off, there is that foundation for additional content to be added even when we are no longer part of the project. Um, and so that's, that's something that, you know, we're trying to figure out what is the best solution, um, you know, and also that this website would potentially be hosted sort of independent of, you know, CMU or theaters, you know, and, and it would actually belong to it. So, um, you know, ideas that we've had, so verastark.org, um, potentially additional domains, and um, any sort of tools that we can sort of bring to the table and package it, so that then Lynn and her team could, you know, uh, just take that and then let it keep going additionally. Um, one of the other key challenges that we have is how do you play test something like this, right? Because if the audience is supposed to help create the content, how do we encourage the audience to actually participate? Um, so that is something too that we're thinking, okay, do we actually have seed content? Um, you know, have users who sort of spark the conversation, you know, if Herb is actually a moderator, you know, how does that sort of work into um, sort of this half real, half fake uh, discussion website um, entity? So uh, that's sort of an insight to uh, the process that we're going through currently with this project. Um, so now I'm going to open it up for questions. I think uh, my question is a little bit further um, around the idea of the audience participation, since it is the act three of the play. And obviously I, I know how act one and act two will be informed by the four, within the four walls of the theater. But then when, in act three, it, uh, how does that happen? Or how do you see that happening? Outside of, is, is it about the audience going home and getting on their computers, or is there something happening in the space that encourages that dialogue? Well, I think that that's one of the conversations we're having, is how do we drive the audience that's in the theater to the website after they've had the theatrical experience? Right. And I know that when we did it originally at Second Stage, that was part of the problem, is like, how do we get people there? And um, we didn't solve that problem, and I'm hoping that, that by the end of the semester that that's something that we're able to have a solution for. Maybe, maybe as a way to help with that answer, uh, I'll talk a little bit about what the core user experience on the site is. Uh, this site that Herb Forrester has built, it's kind of a cross between a simple fan site to Vera Stark, because he really is her fan who wants her memory to live on, and a kind of curated permanent connection collection of artifacts from her life, as if you had a museum exhibit with photos and film clips and audio interviews all about uh, things that she had done and places she had been and people she talked with. And in the beginning, we'd like the audience to just visit and explore this collection and get to know Vera Stark's career better. Over time, um, which I think can only happen after they go home, we see the more dedicated audience members finding themselves contributing this, to this collection as well. Maybe creating artifacts that are bits of Vera's life and helping contribute to that story of her life. Um, and then the, the curatorial, you know, the editing process uh, that Lynn's team will be in control of and that maybe down the road they'll be able to hand off uh, allows us to set apart the permanent collection of things we do consider canon from general user contributions and to be able to move through especially good contributions over into that permanent collection so that it becomes a collaborative process. 
And also, if I can continue, I mean, one of the goals is for the audience to be able to interact with those characters, say, a year or two after they've seen the play, and that when they go to the website, that there is constant new content for them to engage with. Internally, we've discussed a feature of the website where at any point you could click a certain link and turn on kind of a behind the scenes view and see real artist credits for who created these individual artifacts and real details about when they were created and why. So that there's sort of a, a live, like a commentary track on a DVD that you can turn on and off at will to either say, I want to have myself totally immersed in the fiction of this world or I want to see what's actually true and what's not all the time. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's almost, it's kind of like staging a play. You're asking people to suspend disbelief, but you're not pretending that what's, that when someone dies on stage, you're, that they're actually not going to be back up the next day. So we're asking for a similar kind of suspension of disbelief where we still acknowledge that it's fiction. Uh, here. Uh, My question is similar to hers. You said that the New York Film Academy approached yes, you yes. to get an interview with Herb Forster. They when invited you... her to lecture. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So when they found out what the real deal was, did they think it was hilarious or were yeah, they not yeah, amused? Yeah, they thought it was very funny. Oh. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, so um, this may be a question for Lynn maybe for you guys. So the Geffen and the Goodman Theater are the two partnering theaters for this project. Um, but the website itself will it'll be sort of moderated and controlled by you moving forward. And I saw a lot of content that was already made. Um, the same question that I think some people were asking about the video game, there would be different actors playing Vera and, and uh, in the plays. 
does the content change? Do you film a new documentary? Do you film a new... Well, I think that that's, that's one of the conversations that we're in the midst of having, is how can we create a documentary about Vera Stark in which we don't see Vera Stark? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, how can we put up representations of Vera Stark where you don't see her? And I think that that's the biggest challenge. Right. I think one of the answers to that is some of the clips you saw in the documentary were like, Somebody had circled the back of somebody's head and, <laughs> and said, oh yeah, there was Vera at this event. And we can absolutely see audience members understanding that's sort of the convention yeah. for this experience. And um, if you build a community that understands that, you'll have all sorts of situations where you can just barely see you know, the back of somebody's head and the side of their face, and they'll create a whole story that goes with this photograph that could go with any actress on stage. Um, is there a reason why um, you want people to see the website as the third act and why they couldn't see it before the show and so it could then function in a couple of different ways? Well, I think that many people are resonant once they've seen the full journey of Vera Stark. Um, I think that people can certainly go to the website and they can have a satisfying experience before seeing the show, but I think that it will not be a complete tale without right. having seen those first two acts. But it won't spoil the it show. It won't spoil, I, yeah. hopefully it won't spoil the show for them. I was at a uh, technology workshop last week and they were talking about how um, computer uh, websites and phone apps, they're, they're changing in terms of relationships of use. Have you thought about using this as a phone app? as a way to increase who can have access to it and when? We have thought about making it into a phone app. Uh, because of the time limitations of our semester, we're beginning by making it a web page, which will be viewable on most of modern phones, like an iPhone will be able to open it up. Uh, it's conceivable that down the road, the project could be expanded to include an actual phone app to tie into the same information, so that it would be easy for somebody to say, take a picture, of a supposed sighting of Vera Stark and upload it to the website. Uh, but we really, with our 14 weeks, which really is the blink of an eye for software development, uh, we've decided to start with the website, which can be viewed across as many platforms as possible. And if I can add to that, one of our biggest challenges is building this framework that users can actually submit content, and content that can be images or writing or even video if they get really involved, because it becomes almost a hobbyist site. So for us to tackle it, we're not too worried about the phone app because there's not much content that's going to get submitted by phone. It's more about this website and going on it and becoming involved in this community and trying to invent the story around this character. So are you guys the same team working on both projects concurrently? And how many projects are you working on concurrently? We, we are the same team. We're working on the two projects, the Chris Diaz and Lynn Nottage projects concurrently. And how does that work with, um, in terms of like what the, what the roles are and how your involvement shifts? Um, we're, we have a really convenient setup, actually, where uh, we have our dramaturg and then we have two producers, two artists, and two programmers. So we're able to almost split right down the middle uh, with Dana having extra work. <laughs> 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 to divide and conquer on these projects. So we actually, in each category, we're assigning leads on the project. All of us will work on both because the constant feedback is good, mm -hmm. but it allows us to give everybody ownership of a specific portion of one project or the other. So I'm, I'm guessing the answer will probably feed into the intellectual property discussion later on, but uh, you know, I'm wondering about the reward system of this ARG, where if you submit you know, an artifact that really jives with the mythos of Vera Stark. It could be in this permanent collection, right? Mm -hmm. But is there this, this idea that maybe that these community-generated artifacts could then feed back into the, the Act 1 or 2? Like in a future revision, there's community-generated history of Vera's life that then is alluded to within the play that you've written. Like, I, I, I think that's interesting, but then you do really get into intellectual properties questions. Yeah and questions of, of, owner, of authorship. Right. Of, but it's, it's an interesting idea. Uh, I think it would be really reasonable because there will be a formal editing process where you actually have to communicate with Herb Forrester or 
with Lynn's team through Herb Forrester, <laughs> that part of that process could be, hey, is this content you want something you want to give permission for that to be involved in future works? There's something really exciting about that, right? You know, being involved with this community and what you make, the amount of part that you put into it could actually end up being part of this almost immortalized play. So would you give a new direction? Would it be the new direction? Well, it would be up to Lynn Nott. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 I mean I, ideally, it would begin, I'd begin as the curator of the site so that there are not things that go up there that sort of really um, so shift the direction that I, I want it to go in, but eventually I give over to the community and I think that that's one of the things that really interests me is how a community can shape the aesthetic and move it. Um, one, of, one of the ideas that we have is um, an autobiography that has just recently be, been found and ideally I'd like the community to contribute to pages so that you know the first chapter could be written by someone other than myself. No, I was talking about the new direction. These people like if you incorporated their story into a revision of the play, they don't get paid. Or do they? You know, I, I don't know. We haven't crossed that, that bridge, but I, I imagine that at some point, if the idea is such that it's, it's interwoven with the narrative, that there would be some compensation. I can't imagine just taking someone's idea and putting it out there and not sort of sharing mm -hmm. credit for it. Uh, just as an example, I, I saw a play a couple of years ago in Krakow in Poland as part of a festival. It was called Supernova, and it was a sort of community engagement play, and it was created through interviews with people in this particular community outside of Krakow. And the way the play came out was that the first act of it was a museum that you attended, which had a whole series of exhibits, many of which had online content. Um, but that had uh, memories of various people in the community. There was a room that you went into that had uh, photos of different people who uh, people in the community remembered who were all dead and had different uh, stories about them. Uh, there was a, a, and it was all done from the point of view of 500 years in the future where you were going back and sort of looking at the history of this community today. I won't go on about it, but basically it sort of took that idea of engaging with the community, developing content, creating all of these museum displays that created, that created all these online interactive things. You spent an hour immersed in that experience, and then you actually sat and watched uh, two short plays uh, that were performed by actors um, that also carried forward some of the history. So it was, it was a, a, a way of almost doing that from the outset, what you're, what you're describing, Lynn, and making it part of the, the whole structure of the play. Yes, we introduce Bring on Harrison yeah. Rivers. Thank you. Since I'm in the third presentation, I will attempt to be very brief. Um, uh, my name is Harrison David Rivers, and the, uh, the full title of my piece is actually Look Upon Our Lowliness, a Spoken Word Elegy for a Chorus of Male Voices. Um, and just to sort of give you an idea of what the piece is, um, I'll start with the synopsis, and then I'll sort of go into how the piece came about, um, and then I'll talk a bit about my involvement in the Cyber Narrative Project. Um, the synopsis is that the play charts the relationships of eight gay men reeling from an unexpected and unexplained death of a close friend. The men, a painter, a writer, a curator, a dancer, a nanny, a student, a slut, and a suit, <laughs> turn to sex, to work, to drink, to tears, and to each other in an attempt to um, make sense of the world around them, um, a world forever changed by the exit of this specific loved one. Um, and they turn to each other for empathy, for solace, for laughter. They turn to each other in hopes of discovering or uncovering some kind of truth. Um, and so the play does deal very specifically with death, but um, what I sort of 
have loved in the genesis of this piece is how it started someplace very sad and it's become something um, almost joyful. Um, and this is probably due to the genesis of the actual piece. The, the idea, or some of the ideas that are expressed in the play began with uh, David Mendezabal, who um, is one of the artistic sort of leaders of the Movement Theatre Company, um, who came to me in mid-2010 and he essentially said something like, Harrison, I really want to write a play about men, <laughs> about masculinity and about drag and about the ways in which we express our masculinity. Um, and he also wanted to talk about faith and religion and iconography and so there were so many things. And I was like, okay, 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 slow down, <laughs> slow down. Great, these are all great ideas, but what's the story? And David uh, was essentially <laughs> like, well, you know, you're the writer. <laughs> Which is often the case. You're the writer, so figure it out. And I sort of took all of these ideas and I went away and I, um, I was sort of ruminating on them. And in 2010, um, there was the, the inaugural White Light Festival at Lincoln Center, um, which is a festival that is sort of designed to introduce uh, New York City and the world to, to music that really sort of um, sort of opens up our understanding of the universe. And one of the exhibits in the White Light Festival was this um, installation by Janet Carter called the 40 Part Motet. And this piece features a piece of Renaissance music by a man named Thomas Tallis, which is called Spem and Alium. And it's essentially a meditation on, on faith. Um, it tells the story of Judith from the Book of Judith, which is sort of one of those books of the Bible that didn't up, end up in the Bible, about a woman who um, cuts the head off of the enemy army captain and in a sense saves her people. And it is her sort of at the entrance to this general's tent praying to God for um, not to survive but to give her the courage and the strength to go into the tent. Um, and so this piece which is done in a studio space with 40 speakers lining the walls. Each speaker has one of the 40 voices. <coughs> and if you move close to one of the speakers, you hear that voice in particular. If you stand in the center of the room, you hear all 40 voices. And so this sort of idea of a piece that begins with one voice and crescendos to 40 became the structure for Look Upon Our Loneliness. And so this piece begins with a phone call, which then becomes a duet, a trio, a quartet, and so on and so forth. And the piece ebbs and flows very similarly to this particular piece of music. Um, so that is sort of where this piece began. Um, when TMTC was invited to be a part of the Cyber Narrative Project, this play was not done. In fact, we had maybe an act one, <laughs> which makes it a very different project than Lynn's or than Chris's because their plays were already done. So we were looking at the piece, establishing themes, and then creating either a beginning or an ending or something that was going to enhance the storytelling. Um, and with my play, we were sort of like, well, we could create something that sort of goes along with what you've already written. Or I think what sort of blew my mind initially was Chris and Dana suggested, well, what if you use technology all the way through? So that we open with something that people can access sort of the world of the play before they arrive at the theater and have to come to the theater to witness the actual event. The technology continues throughout the play while they're in the theater, and then because they've come to the theater, they have access to even more content after. So this is almost a marriage of what we're doing with Chris and Lynn's pieces in that it goes all the way through. So these components at the beginning and the end are now sort of interwoven. Um, one of the major sort of devices of the play um, are these phone calls, it's this sort of phone technology. And that is sort of the primary um, way in which audience members receive information about the ongoing relationships amongst the men in the piece. They receive phone calls and text messages, and at certain moments in the play, all of the phones ring, creating this sort of oral experience um, and sort of helping to heighten the storytelling um, and then encouraging people to dialogue after the piece with some of the information that they received on these devices. Um, I'll sort of clarify, the idea is also that when each person enters the space, they are given a phone or some sort of device that is, all of the information is sort of transferred to them um, through that device throughout the course of the play. Um, 
So I am in sort of a very different place than Chris and Lynn in that um, sort of the play is just now reaching a place where it's sort of finished. So now is the time to sort of take some of these larger ideas and begin to apply them. And I suppose that now is a good time to have Dana, do you want to come up and, and Chris too? Yeah. And the two of you can speak to a little bit of our process dramaturgically and also sort of the ways in which we discuss using technology that were sort of mind-blowing for me that I think really have enhanced the piece in my head as I've been writing. So, awesome. Yeah, well, um, one of the things that I really wanted to engage in the project from my own personal passion was this idea of really trying to engage the audience in the story from the beginning. It's a technique I've used in video games um, where we were treating uh, everything involved in, in the video game as part of the story. We started telling the story for this one project in the ads that were placed in magazines and on the web and not from the sense of just simply um, showing a character, but like what the character was doing would, in the ad, inform the way that the players met the character in the game. And that, that idea really fascinates me, uh, because it sort of becomes postmodern storytelling in a really interesting way, and immerses everybody from the very first encounter with the content into the story. So it was really exciting for me that Harrison's work was in process because, you know, I was fascinated by what would happen if I made the suggestion, <laughs> right? Um, because I've worked a lot with, I mean, I'm a playwright, I've worked with playwrights in the video game industry, and it is a very, very challenging thing for any writer, especially a playwright, who the process, in my experience, is sort of different from, let's say, a television writer where you've got maybe eight people in the room and they're all sort of attempting to manipulate the story. A playwright's process tends to be more solitary, at least in my experience, right? So, like, the, in the struggles for a playwright are often internal. And to give away some of that process to collaborators as early as Harrison was willing to, was ex exhilarating for me because I think it opens up the space for what is possible when we, in a secondary way, ask the audience to come into that storytelling space. Um, and, and part of why Dana was engaged in the project in the beginning was she had uh, worked with me in an interactive story class that I had taught the year before and I knew that she thought about story in this way. So when we were able to get a playwright that was sort of willing and gracious enough to allow us to engage the story on that level, we added data to the mix. We had the opportunity to do something that was really interesting to me. So why don't you talk about the, the back and forth process, if you will. Sure. Uh, so what we were trying to figure out was how we could use technology to better understand the characters that Harrison was writing. So we came up with a lot of ideas that involved tones and technology like that people can bring table because that was something that a lot of the characters were interacting with during the actual story. It's so a logical extension it, yeah, exactly. of the current, it, or the existing world. But. Yeah, so it wasn't, it wasn't too far a leap to say, well, they're using cell phones. Maybe we could use cell phones. <laughs> huh. So we thought about how we could use cell phones to, like I said, to, to better understand certain characters. Uh, in the beginning, our focus was mostly on the, the deceased friend. Um, we were talking about ways that we could get the audience to know uh, Tyler, is his name, to know Tyler as his friend circle does, so that when you walk into the play, you are feeling that same sense of loss that uh, the characters do when they realize that their friend is, is dead. Um, Later, that evolved to talking more about how we could understand each of the eight men, potentially through, uh, as Harrison was saying, through 
phones. So, and, and these are these are just ideas. Um, so these, but uh, we were talking about how we could potentially use those to explore for different audience members, one person. And so, for example, um, I might have a phone that belongs to character A. So I receive character A's texts, and I see characters, and I see the text that character A sends throughout the play to characters B, C, D, blah, blah, blah. And so each person in the audience would be able to see, some, and, and each person in the audience would be able to see a different character, and they'd be able to better understand a certain character, so that after the play is over, in the lobby, they can all discuss the events that they saw, and they, in, in the same kind of way that if you go toward one speaker in that, in that installation piece, you can hear one voice, and then you step into the middle and you can hear all of them. We wanted to make it so that stepping into the middle meant talking to people, talking to the other people who had seen the play and say, well, what character did you look at? Did you get character C? Because character A said this thing, and I didn't really understand like why they were arguing. And then the person who saw character C was like, oh, well, it's because of something that happened. Like, and, and you know, you're able to better understand the story, and you're able to talk about the story. So these, these ideas are still shifting. We're still trying to figure out exactly what we want to do. But we we're really excited about all of these opportunities to just work with exploring character. Uh, whether it's one or eight. You know, I just wanted to add, I have to give Harrison a lot of credit. Um, you know, engaging a story from multiple points of view simultaneously <laughs> is like mind-blowing for a writer, right? It totally, totally is. And um, in, in the gaming industry, we sort of deal with this routinely and, you know, it's just part of the soup we, 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 we create for ourselves. But as, as I've nurtured writers coming from traditional linear media into the interactive space, it is a total alteration in, in their sense of how to structure something so that it can land for an individual audience member if that's the only one who, who sees it, or allow audience people to sort of own some of the story and then contribute to it. Um, and, you know, I, I'm speculating here, but I don't think you knew how deep that well was when you began. I did not. <laughs> and and I, I, having wrestled that demon myself many times, I, I knew that that sort of epiphany was coming, because we all end up trying to face it at some point and wrestle it to the ground. Um, but Harrison really engaged it head on, and I really wanted to give you credit for that. Um, <laughs> you know, and um, you know, I, I've watched like uh, Dana try to create like interactive stories in this one class that teaches about interactive stories. And one of the exciting things about marrying interactivity with the theater space was the, the potential to get the audience engaged. Right? I, I tell my students like you've got all an in interactive story. You've got all the problems that you have in linear media, and you add to that getting the audience member to care enough to do something. Not just watch it, but to engage it. Um, and I had never heard your, um, I, I knew about the piece of music, and I knew how that had acted as, a, as an inspiration to you, but I had never heard the explanation until today of the idea of going to a speaker and hearing the one voice and going into the middle, because that's, essentially a, an amazingly powerful tool in interactive story is the conversation that happens and that the story kind of comes out of the communication between everybody who's experienced it, which is one of the most exciting things to me. Shall we do questions? Sure. There, there are. Yes, sir. So, very exciting uh, ideas around this project, I think. I'm. Uh, but I got a problem in mind. So immediately I wonder how this production or any production of it will manage kind of the audience's attention budget over over time as you move through between things that are happening happening in the kind of performed audio domain and then in the delivered text uh, domain. 
So what, this idea of playing with all eight people communicating, I think that as I've been discussing this more and more with TMTC, that we're moving more away from that and looking at um, receiving messages from one character so that the, what you're seeing in your device is more integrated into the larger uh, per performance. Um, so that is something that we discussed quite a bit and that we've been discussing um, like how do you sort of clarify that story a bit. So I think maybe not having everybody in the audience receiving information from different characters automatically sort of uh, tightens that lens a bit and allows for the story that's being told in your lap to also sort of enhance what you're seeing on stage as opposed to sort of wondering which parts you missed. I sort of love the notion of the audience tracking one character. It means that they have to come back eight times. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the only problem with that is that you have to then, like, what if they get the same person the next? I mean, oh. right. I mean, it, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting quandary when you have that many characters whose stories are potentially rich enough to follow individually. Um, and sort of how do you decide which story or which perspective gives you the most story or perspective when you're watching the thing on stage. So it is something that we're still definitely wrestling with and sort of trying to figure out where to put, where to put our energy and where to sort of focus the audience's energy as well. This is a question for the project overall. My understanding is, is that including, one of the reasons for this is uh, including technology would uh, uh, um, bring in younger audiences into theater. That, that's one of the things. Okay, most of the th time I go to theater, most of the people there are old, like me. Okay, so has anybody addressed the question of how to get to the young audiences in the first place? so that when they're doing all this technology, you're not just really teaching old people who <laughs> attend the theater about how to use technology. Do you understand my question? Okay. Yeah, I mean, first, you can also do that. I mean, part of what we're teaching using the technology for us to, is to go out to the community. I mean, really, sort of this technology as an extension of the play to younger audiences, I think that, um, one of the great things about the Movement Theater Company is that a large part of that particular theater's audience are, are younger people. Um, and I think that we're also, in using technology that is accessible to, to a, a, a younger audience, I think that that's also an appeal. Um, but others can speak. I, I'm just thinking about, I, I think Harrison's project is the most amazing thing that I've heard of in a long time. But I, I, I uh, thinking about younger audiences, younger audiences, and younger audiences, meaning me, Harrison's younger audience, to me, like, I'm 35, you know, those of us who grew up on television and MTV, our understanding of storytelling is so sophisticated already, and it becomes exponentially more, exponentially more sophisticated storytelling. My six-year-old uh, nephew understands multiple storylines going on at one time while he's playing his iPad and doing 10 million other things. So I think there's something about the new kinds of forms and fracture works and different ways to tell stories that's going to be fundamentally um, appealing to a different kind of audience to begin with. Whether we try to make it a marketing tool or not, that's a different kind of question. But the kind of work that these guys um, are talking about right now, and the kind of work that and it's not even necessarily younger audiences as so much as different audiences too. Audiences who aren't necessarily going to the theater. I know, like, uh, I know lots of people who will, will be so um, excited to participate in Lynn's online third act that wouldn't necessarily even come to the theater the same way, whether they're young, a young college kid, a young graduate student, an older person who thinks that way. Um, so I think there's a certain amount of, by expanding the scope of potential uh, narrative tools that we're automatically expanding the scope of audience, hopefully. You know, we get away a little bit from, from the um, family sitting on the couch drinking red wine play, which does turn certain people off. And by opening it up like this, maybe you're expanding to a different audience. I, I think that for me, some of it was just a 
allowing access to the story material through avenues that internet-centric audiences are used to finding story. You know, um, uh, part of what drove me to the project was I, for a number of years, I managed a design team of, of about 20 designers on a huge project that we were doing in the transmedia storytelling space. So these designers were all story aficionados in the first place. And they, like Chris talks about, their, their sense of being able to dissect and analyze and understand story, you know, was exponentially more sophisticated than mine at a similar age, and I think probably exceeds mine even now, right? Um, and they would consume story in comics and on the web and on, in film and on television and in all these media. They, they would just where they were ravenous for story, but they would never go to the theater. Because they did not perceive the theater was a place where interesting stories took place. It just wasn't part of their lexicon. And, you know, I would drag them to theater productions, right? We'd have theater hours. And they'd come away going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, I can't believe it. She was standing right in front of me. I'm like, you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> they got it when they were exposed to it. And they appreciated it when they were exposed to it. But it wasn't part of And these people would, you know, stand online for 24 hours to get into a midnight showing of Harry Potter. It wasn't that they weren't willing to get up and go. They just didn't include theater in their spectrum of things they wanted to do. So when I heard about the project, I thought that technology could be sort of a head fake to get them to pay attention in the first place. Because I saw that once they were aware that what theater could bring in the magic that we all share a love for would attract them anyway. They just never considered it before. So if that meant the entry was a comic book, or if that meant the entry was a website, or if that meant that they heard about this interesting play where they sat in an audience and they got text messages. How cool is that? I didn't care. As long as they got their butts in the seats at some point. For me. Right. Well, I'd actually like to um, thank you all and move into the uh, panel discussion portion of this because I think we're, we're sort of moving into a general question phase, which is perfect. Um, I think a perfect way to wrap up. Um, so thank you, Harrison, thank you so much. <laughs> says that here's the, the nugget, the kernel. So let's assume Microsoft. We have different operating systems that everybody's familiar with. So you have on one hand Microsoft operating system and you have a Mac operating system. Along comes Linux. And 
there are, I don't know, maybe 10 to 12 different open source programming doctrines that people sort of subscribe to. And each of those doctrines have different rules. The largest one is called the GNU doctrine, and that's sort of what the, the Linux is based on. Those rules say, and you have to look at the rules of the specific programming that you're using, they dictate how and what rules will apply. So but let's stick with Linux to make it for, for simplicity's sake. You build a program based on Linux, you're agreeing that you're giving up your copyright. You're waiving it, essentially. That means that if someone else takes your programming, embeds it, and uses it, you don't have a copyright claim. You may have a patent claim still, which most people don't realize. You certainly have a trademark claim still. Uh, we do a lot of work with Red Hat. Red Hat's an open source company. Red Hat has a program. You could go on tomorrow, take it, put your own name on it, and sell it. No problem. What you can't do, technically, is sell it as Red Hat without giving some notoriety back to them. You know, you'd have to make clear that this is not an authorized copy and the like, so there's ways to do that. Once you use that kernel to create your program and you make the next version of it or anything else, you're also agreeing that your improvement or your modification will also be open source. The way I advise clients is the following. Let's assume we'll use Microsoft Word, and at the end of the day, Microsoft Word will say is not an open source program, but they want to bring in a component that is open source. If they can make it so that it's a plugin, let's assume it's spell check, they will not infect the rest of the program so long as it's a plugin. If, on the other hand, they decide to incorporate spell check into the operating system, the, the source code as a whole, they've now infected the whole Microsoft program, and as a result, they've essentially waived their copyright. So, in this arena, if you guys are making programming, it's really important to understand what that means for you. If you're designing it based on open source, which is one of the cheapest ways to go because you're not paying license fees, you're going to be restricted on what you can actually license out and how you can recognize the profit. So you just sort of have to understand what you're using and what the limitations are. Does that jive with um, the way that you often are thinking about the, just the tools that you use as starting points? Um, yeah, that, that's pretty much the accepted definition of how open source work. Um, I was particularly wondering about um, the implications for the project as they um, could be used by specific theaters for specific productions. Because um, one of the things that we've been talking about is um, whether there are ways for individual theaters to then make slight adaptations or modifications to the cyber interface for the particular productions um, that we're trying to, to promote. Um, if, just for argument's sake, hypothetically, will they produce Chad Beauty? Hypothetically. <laughs> Not saying we're going to do it. Um, and we uh, took the video game and did something very specific, like um, superimposed the face of the actor playing Mace into the game. That would be terrible and we wouldn't do it, but just as an example. Um, and then we used that for uh, the purposes of promoting and enhancing our own show. Um, that modification would then also be open source. So if another theater wanted to use our version of it, they could or no? I see some heads shaking. Well, OK, so we're talking about open source as it applies to the underlying code structure. The content is a different issue, right? Um, Carnegie Mellon's agreement with its students is kind of unique, and it applies to all client-based projects. It's a mutual <coughs> license to the material, right? Mm -hmm. So in theory, um, like Chris may own it and the students may own it, which means that the students could build upon that in some theoretical universe and do something with it, but Chris would have the right to go off and do what he wanted to do with it as well. So as long as, in your example, in a theoretical sense, if you were to ever do a production of JMP, you would go to Chris and you would say to Chris, we want to put a face to replace this character with our actor. If Chris says it was okay, he has the right to do that because he owns the that instance of this game, right? Chris could add modifications to it if he wishes because he also owns it, but so could the students in theory. Uh -huh. but, but also, I agree with your point. And it's important to understand if uh, Electronic Arts made a game based on Lord of the Rings, and they used open source to make the programming for that game, that doesn't mean they waived any rights in the story. It just means the programming, how I kill you, 
hit points and all the other stuff might be open source. The story itself is absolutely protectable and it's not waived. So you need to distinguish between the programming and the story per se. Right, and that's a good example. I, I was at EA when they did the Lord of the Rings games. And the, the arrangement was the license was very restrictive. They could take these story elements and apply it to this release. If they wanted to take those story elements and do a new version, they had to adjust the basic template of the agreement because the Tolkien estate owns all of that, you know. Even if, if EA had done a new rendering of Gandalf, new drawing, new illustration, they were agreeing that the rights to the illustration would sort of roll up into the Tolkien estate, that they were only granting the single use of that content in that product. So okay. yeah, there's this content and tools are really two uh -huh. separate pieces. That's, that's very helpful for us to hear, I think, here in the theater world. Um, let me add another element, which is the public, the community. Um, when we were talking about Lynn's project, we were talking about the idea of, I, I think the right term for it is crowdsourcing, right? Is allowing the community to contribute, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Well, that, that's, a, that's one question that I have. What is crowdsourcing? Is it, is it a different thing to just allow the community to contribute elements to the work that Lynn and the students are, are making? Is that what crowdsourcing is? Is crowdsourcing something different? It's different. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Um, Tony, can you, can you define that for us? I, I don't know what crowdsourcing is. I can tell you what the law is once you explain it to sure. me. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> crowdsourcing is essentially sourcing information from a crowd. So pulling and gathering information rather than content. So let's go so, uh, In Lynn's example, the uh, autobiography was allowed to be contributed to, and I could write the first chapter. Right. I wouldn't need Lynn's permission to write the first chapter. There'd be a slot on the website. And let's just say, for our example's sake, I was the first one to write that initial chapter. And it would get posted up, and we all could read it. See, I could do that different. So let's, let's go through some different scenarios. Um, it's important to understand that copyright protection only attaches to something that's fixed. So if I go around and say, what's your favorite movie? What, what's, what's the most important aspect to you, to you, to you, to you? And I write these down. You don't own the copyright, any of that. You could maybe sue me for idea theft, possibly. But it's not copyright infringement because you didn't write it down. You haven't affixed it to anything in any tangible form. There are exceptions. If I record you, different story. But I'm technically the person that's recording it, so I own the copyright. That's a trick that most people don't get. So if I go in and you make a, a UGC video, and I tape you in it. I own the copyright. You don't own it. You wrote the script. Maybe you own the script and this is a derivative of it. But the person that recorded it technically is the owner of the copyright. There are other rights involved outside of that. So I don't want to lose sight of that, but it's not a copyright. The second thing that's important to understand with copyright, it only applies to uh, expression. It doesn't apply to facts and things like that. So if I did a crowdsource, and that's the way I thought of it was, you know, what, what would you like to see in these different elements? So if I got little nuggets from everybody, I don't think that anybody would have rights in that as a whole. I, think I took it back, I synthesized it, I put it together, I own the rights. Now we switch gears to your situation. So we're going to have uh, a, a work that's worked on by multiple people, and it's going to morph and change, and we're going to let people add to it. This is tricky, because under the copyright law, there's a concept of joint ownership. And so if you and I agree at the beginning stages that we're going to both contribute to a work, um, what the law is, is that both of us have the right to exploit the whole work. As long as we understood that you weren't creating a you know, standalone Star Wars book, and I have a different Star Wars book, but if we were writing chapters that was meant to be one work, the law is without an agreement, and this is important, that each of us has the right to exploit the whole book without permission from the other person. What I owe the other person is a royalty for their particular contribution. So that's one of the reasons that it's so important when you have these types of collaborations, that there's an agreement expressing who owns what, who has what. Because imagine if you and I had a, 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 a five of us contributed to a book. We all had rights, but there was no agreement. And I decided I wanted to give it away for free. You can't stop me. You get no royalty from me because I made no money on it. And so it's very important at the, end, the beginning stages that we dictate how this can be shared, how the royalties are split, is there a non-compete, what 
and who's going to own what. You'll notice now, the exception to this is if you work for me. If you're an employee within the scope of your employment, so I hired you to make this programming for me, and you're my employee, I technically own it, I don't need an agreement. It makes sense, right? I paid you to do this and create it for me. If you're an accounting, and I'm asking you to comment on this, so I didn't pay you to you know, comment on my work, you're doing this outside of the scope, I need an agreement, and they call that a work for hire agreement. And usually the company tries to assess the ownership of it. So that's sort of the whole spectrum. I have a question about, oh, I'm sorry. I missed, go ahead. I, I want to ask a question with regards to that. Um, are you familiar with the Johnny Cash project? Keep going. Um, the Johnny, it's it's um, it's a, a Johnny Cash song in which artists are invited to animate individual cells, mm -hmm. and it, um, the music video is a, a combination of all of those individual cells. So it really is truly a collaborative project. In that instance, if it was broadcast, who would own it? Well, I would imagine if they were smart, they would have had an agreement to allow all artists to waive the rights of these. And, and if they don't, then any of you guys can. Anybody that contributed technically has an ownership piece in it. A joint owner has the unfettered right to distribute it without an agreement otherwise. I have an unrelated question about, for instance, music and other copyrighted elements that the team or Chris may say, oh, well, I like this particular song, We Are the Champions, whatever. In this project, how would you handle that? Okay, so music is really tough. There's a whole separate copyright law that applies to the realm of music than applies to anything else. It's important to understand. So I can go and I can record We Are the Champions. I can sing We Are the Champions on stage now, and I could not get sued for it. Um, you know, I, 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 they, they could not stop me from doing it. I would owe them some royalty, but they don't have approval rights. It's called mechanic license. In some instances, I can record it and put it on a record, and I have to pay them a statutory fee for that. That's easy. The minute it goes beyond recording and in, 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 I'm putting it into a play, now I'm changing the, 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 the dynamics substantially, and it's not covered under that negotiated license. So technically, I have to go to the artist or the record company that probably owns it and say, I want to use it as, you know, in a theatrical work, and, as, and it's going to be this scene. I'm going to have to technically go to permission, and, and that's going to be negotiated in a case-by-case -case basis, unless I can argue that it's fair use. So it's relevant to the, the format. It's relevant, it, you know, there's a whole, and fair use is a very difficult question. But there are examples where I could use uh, something in the case of parody without permission. So you think about the um, Pretty Woman song. Rap band comes out with it, puts a slightly different tone on it. They're able to claim that it wasn't a copyright. Now, Roy Everson wasn't able to do it because it was done in the context where it was using it for a different expression or a parody. So if you took We Are the Champions and you put it to some type of spoof where it was relevant to the subject matter, you might be able to argue that it's fair use without permission. But it's a tough, I mean, it's, it's not a black line rule in that <laughs> If a, my understanding, I'm not a lawyer, um, is, is that, if, on TV. <laughs> is the, if, if uh, anything that we produce, we, um, use music that's either available or, or, or is not, we don't need to get them, I forget what the term is for the music that sits on the internet that like they... They, they have some, it's, it's a type of open source. Okay. Or, or, or it's, and actually it's rights managed, they call it. Right, right, right. A company like Corpus. And Correct. Um, if, if we hand um, the final entity over, over to Chris and, and a theater, some random theater, decides to do a production and wants to add We Are the Champions to that play of the game on their website, I'm suspecting that they'd have to go get the rights for that. Probably. I, I, if, if I was in, in that group, I'd say, let's make a couple phone calls to see where our rights end in the beginning. Maybe. Um, there's a great saying in the law, it's better to ask for forgiveness than for permission. Um, so, the first thing I would do is go to my lawyer and say, do I have an argument under fair use? You know, do I have some type of argument? Only after that would I go and ask for permission, because if they say no, I mean, once you go and ask for permission, you're screwed. Fascinating. Um, I have one more question, and then I'd love to open it up to you all if you have any other questions. Um, Karen, one of the most confusing 
and sort of entertaining conversations I've ever had with a literary agent was about this project. <laughs> um, when I, I got a call from an agent and, um, and he was trying to understand what this essentially commissioning model was. Mm -hmm. You know, what it meant to compensate a writer for contributing some content to something that was collaboratively created by this whole wonderful group of students. Um, what exactly, you know, how one determines how much a writer would be paid for that, whether, how much of the product then the writer owns, um, how our conventional notion of royalties then work. Um, and, and, you know, ultimately we, we both ended up going, well, this is totally new territory and we don't really know. You know, we're back to sort of like the expectations that we bring in are from, on our side, a conventional, you know, theatrical world. Yes. Um, and so we realized that we didn't even really have enough of a common vocabulary to translate our expectations as artists to the reality of what we were trying to create collaboratively with these students. In tracking this project out, we will answer some of those questions as we get further along. But we did start with a standard understanding, a standard theatrical understanding of what a commission is. And we decided that we think this is really good work and we don't want it to be good work. We want it to be on par with anything that they would commit that they would be commissioned to write for any regional theater in America. So we're going we're going to set that bar here and give a commission to the playwrights. Uh, we envisioned it in two parts that part of their work and part of their commission would be paid once they did the original work, uh, which is the work process they did with Chris and Dana and that section of it. And then we saw the second half of it as the collaborative end, the continued collaboration between the playwright and the team as it began to inch towards an actual product. Um, but we really did, we don't have the answers to the rest of those questions of, you know, well, what happens at this royalty and what are royalties? And from a playwright's point of view, I think, you know, was, I was very vested in the playwright owning as much as possible. Now, I know that's not the final answer because it's not a final product as we're used to in theater, that the playwright owns it and the playwright really receives uh, remuneration from multiple productions of it. But that's actually not the model. We, we, it is a totally new model. And so that part of this being a research and development project is that we will answer these questions as we kind of bump into them mm -hmm. and, and find out what the actual circumstances are. You know, it's, um, I was talking to, um, Dana earlier about this. One way to think about the piece of software, let's take Chris's game as a good example. Um, there is this document that Chris created. Um, we call it a design document in, in the game development world. Uh, it's sort of the equivalent of the manuscript of the play. And then what the students are sort of doing is akin to designing a set in a traditional production environment. Um, and then what we're doing legally is somehow marrying that single production set to the manuscript forever. Um, and therefore, it is exactly as you've described. I don't know any model that applies to that. You know, um, I was going to say, theater is so antiquated in how they handle this. <laughs> and and, and it's, 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 it's a different than other areas. I mean, if you really want to look at the most polished model, you look at the television or movie studio. So somebody comes up, they get a piece of the earnings over a certain amount. You could structure this in a million different ways. I think the first question is ownership. And then, and you shouldn't get too caught up on ownership um, because there's also what a second and equally important term, which is license. And so what... You know, I do a lot of work with television studios, and, and one of the things we have to think through is these co-productions. Am I putting the money out in the first instance? Am I commissioning the work for you? In which case, there's a different ownership component and a different sliding scale on merchandise and everything else that goes with it. And there's been a lot of learning in, in that space to see how different shows have gone. So it's much more sophisticated, but it's a different beast, too. And I wouldn't say it's, a, it's, it's got its problems as well economically. Um, I think it, the, the, the truth is the playwright should own quite a bit, but so should the party that put the money up in the first instance. And then there is a way to have a price license back and forth. So 
you know, first premieres, um, exploitation, second runs, things like this. And then you could put a space on it. But then if the studio actually, if the studio, if the uh, theater actually also put up, they should share some of the benefit from other productions as well. You know, if they actually pushed it. So it's, a, it's an interesting balance, an interesting dance that I see in a lot of different industries. In the gaming industry, uh, I, I think you might be surprised, the gaming industry makes more money in Hollywood. The reason is, because they don't pay the developers anything. Um, and so, in the television industry, it's friggin' broke because you're paying these actors unbelievable salaries that you can't recoup it, so you've got to think through your cost a little better. In this theater industry, I think you guys are on the cusp of something new and a new way of thinking. And there's ways to structure the payments in such a way where ownership is vested in one party, the other party, playwright has ownership, great, it doesn't, it's not important. The real question is what are the rights that they have from a license back or, or something else, or the, the, the theater having it. So the real issue is what are the thresholds under which both parties start to reap additional compensation benefits, and what are the exploitation rights? Are they limited to, you know, uh, first runs, are they limited to geographic areas? You know, um, what is what are the, the what are going to be the, the revenue splits? And that's where I, I, I think that this is the right area, and there's a lot of other industries that you guys can use to sort of to learn from. Are there other questions for Tony or Chris or Karen? Yes? I have one from Twitter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> at JD Carter says, um, the other exception um, is under Creative Commons. Can you ask about that? So I think we're trying to get at like what um, content, how content is managed under something like Creative Commons might be used in, in this and talking about how things like that work. I don't know enough about Creative Commons, so I'd be scared to say anything. Fair answer. What? I don't. I, don't know. I think I don't. I have a Twitter. I have like it's an at at. So I I can read you what Twitter Creative Commons describes itself as if yes. that would help. Um, Creative Commons is a nonprofit corporation dedicated to making it easier for people to share and build upon the work of others, um, consistent with the rules of copyright and actual symbol. So that means copyright law applies, and they didn't take, they didn't do it, they, they, they're leaving it to you guys to figure that out. Copyright law applies with these exceptions. Yeah, and so, um, remember, I could write the next chapter of Lord of the Rings, and no one could stop me. Uh, if I'm not selling it, if I'm doing it for a class project, I mean, there's a whole fair use component. And that's why copyright law is really one of the hardest areas to, to do a black and white. The minute I start to exploit that work, I got big problems. But if I'm doing it, you know, and posting it, here's how I think uh, what would happen after, you know, Star Wars or something, or, or, you know, and I wanted to write it and I put it out there, there's, I, I, you'd have a hard time coming after me until I tried to exploit it. Um, there was the Gone with the Wind scenario where they wrote, uh, I don't remember, but they, they did it from a different perspective. Right. 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 Had that just been written, you know, for a project and it wasn't exploited, you wouldn't have a problem. I mean, they could have tried to complain, but I think at the end of the day, you know, it, 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 the, the, they would have had a fair use argument, possibly, or some defense. The minute they tried to exploit that, you got a different game happening because you start to fall out of the fair use a little more. So if this Creative Commons is merely for people putting it up and, to, you know, the sole purpose is to get creative juices flowing and to get people thinking and stuff, they might be fine. They want to take that and publish it in a book, then we go back into copyright. Did you have that? Yeah, that, that, base, that fundamentally is how Creative Commons works in the wild. Like, I listen to a lot of podcasts that are Creative Commons, and the, the, the disclaimer at the end is you can share this, you can quote it, uh, you just can't sell it. Right. Uh, and a lot of the enthusiast generated content on the web is done under Creative Commons. So, you know, uh, details about fantasy worlds are growing by the day as different individuals, you know, fill in another little corner of some imaginary world. That's all under Creative Commons uh, in most of those cases. And that, that to me feels like the phenomenon I'm already aware of on the web that's most like Lynn's project. It's tricky though, because my experience is once a thing like that hits, I guarantee somebody's coming out of the woodwork saying, where's my share? You know, and that's just the nature of human beings. And so I love to see the contract where, you know, I do this with blogs. When I do a blog policy, I make it clear. Whatever you upload, you're waving all your rights in here. Mm -hmm. Don't 
don't understand, there's no copyright. I don't want anything copyright. You're putting it up, you're waiving your rights. Because I want to be clear at the beginning that if I incorporate that, you've given me the rights to do so, and I don't have to then come back and all of a sudden hit it and have to worry about somebody coming up and saying, you know, I gave you that. I, I told you to turn the world orange instead of blue. So. No, there are creative commons, if I remember correctly, is based on four rights. One that you cannot give up is attribution. If you share my work, you have to say, I'm the one who created it. The second one is redistribution. You're allowed to look at it, and you can share it, or you're allowed to look at it, but you can't share it. The third one is whether you can change it. And the third one is whether you can include it in something that is commercial. And you pick which one of the three optional ones you want, and it produces a license for you. That's good. Any other questions? <laughs> yes. I'm in um, the all things in public health as well as in the arts. And uh, the term going viral, I think, mentioned that it has a whole different connotation for me in health. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a very a positive one here when you're uh, at the same time if something that got, can go viral it's, on, it's out of control um, and so if you're looking at all the um, things you put in place for, for protection and use and uh, autonomy <coughs> and all that if something out there that is out there then then what? You know, um, it doesn't stop you from going after it. The problem is it's whack-a-mole, right? It's like the biggest mistake I think that happened in the last, I don't know, 10 years is going after Napster and taking them down. It was the biggest full-hearted thing they ever did. Because they had everybody in one place, they should have figured out how to license that model, not shut it down. Because once you did that, it's offshore. And you have, now, years later, Apple actually arose from this because it was finally a model they could make some money off of. And so you have to be really careful before you start shutting down things to have an alternative. Um, I went over to Indonesia for a while and I rewrote their copyright law. And um, <laughs> when I was so <laughs> I'll, I'll make the bridge in a second. Uh, they had the MPAA there. And you know I was giving a speech to the judges on why it was important to have protect copyrights and the like. And the MPAA was incredibly silent from other times, and I, I asked him, you know, I, I would have thought you'd be a lot more vocal. He said, well, we learned our lesson here. He said, originally, we got Reagan to tell the president at the time to, you know, fix the copyright problem, and only as an Indonesian, he turned to his general and he said, fix it. The next day, it was fixed. Uh, they went into every place that had movies, and they destroyed all the VHS tapes, and he said, overnight, it was gone. But what happened was a whole other market popped up as a result. So they had these VCDs at the time. Because people were going to find a way to watch these movies. And they killed the one way they had and they learned their lesson. And they said, we don't want to touch a market until we can figure out how to supplement and fix it. And so it's always been a great lesson. So before you go and you shut down a major hub, let's think through how do we, what are the ramifications of that because people are going to get it. But you do get to some point where it's just not worth the money. You've lost it. It's gone almost open. And as part of this project, these, this conversation will continue as we go along at critical points to find out what are the issues in front of us, bringing together people who care and people who are knowledgeable as we sort of bump into various stages of this project and trying to take this project from the playwright and to the theaters to the public. So it's part of our mission is a continuing dialogue about all of these issues at the various stages. Yeah, and to that end, um, I, as we wrap up here, um, I want to encourage everybody to um, keep the conversation going. Um, we should be sending out a follow-up email in a couple days, so please, if you'd like to stay involved in the conversation, reply to that email. Make sure that we've got your information and we can keep you up to date, because um, we would love to continue to uh, you know, share what we learn and, um, and hear questions and reflections and ideas from you all as well. So I want to thank you so much to the students, to the playwrights, Karen, Chris, and Tony, um, this has been fantastic, and thank you all so much.